what is up, everybody? I'm here to give you guys the Retro Wrestling Review Series Season 9, Episode 3. And I'm going to be, uh, in this video, reviewing WWE Battleground 2015. Um, and, you know, obviously we had the first Battleground that was complete crap, that was absolute shit. We had the second one that was actually good. Uh, I, from what I remember, I remember liking this uh, Battleground. So, um... I'll have to see if uh, watching it uh, two years later, uh, I'll feel the same way. Um, and, you know, this was still the pay-per-view in between Money in the Bank and SummerSlam. So this kind of gave us the gap between uh, both pay-per-views, which, you know, I was uh, obviously happy with. So now that I've kind of gone into it, let me uh, just start actually reviewing the show itself. I've just kind of been rambling on for a while. I'm going to structure my review um, you know, a few ways where I cover the pre-show all in one take, and then after, once I start actually watching the show, I'm going to cover all that in different takes. So I hope you guys enjoy this video, and let's just get right into it. Okay, so, uh, this is, uh, actually my bad. I actually forgot to announce what the, uh, match card for, uh, this show was. I do apologize for that. Sometimes that happens. Um... So I was thinking I was just going to redo the video, but instead I'll just uh, make this its own take. So I do apologize. This was on me. Sometimes that stuff happens. So I'm just going to announce what the match code um, is. So we have a total of uh, seven matches on this show, six on the actual show, and then uh, one match on the pre-show. And uh, yeah, so I'm just going to st start announcing what the matches are. Obviously, like I said, we have the pre-show match, or in this case, it's called the kickoff. But I'll just call it the pre show, it really doesn't matter. Um, we have two singles matches on this show. We have a WWE Tag Team Championship match. We have a women's match, or a Divas match, actually, I should say, because back then it was the Divas division. So we have a Divas match. Uh, we have a United States Championship match. And then we have the main event. It's a WWE World Heavyweight Championship match. And I will go through more in depth of what the actual card is um, after I uh, review the pre show. Okay, so starting with the pre-show, we had the panel of Renee Young, Byron Saxton, Booker T, and Corey Graves. Um, obviously, you know where these people have gone. Renee Young uh, would be, continue to host, uh, you know, the panels for the mainstream WWE pay-per-views, and then you know for the uh, NXT specials, uh, she would be the backstage interviewer um, on the main roster, and then eventually um, after the brand split. She would only be the backstage interviewer for SmackDown. She would be the uh, host of uh, Talking Smack until it was canceled. Um, this past, you know, it was canceled just last week. Um, and uh, but she's still the backstage interviewer. She's also host. Uh, I mean, she still hosts Talking Smack because it's going to air after SmackDown exclusive pay per views. And um, she also would go on to be the uh, host of uh, Raw Talk. And um, yeah, that's about it. And uh, Renee Young's on pretty far with the WWE. She has a pretty steady job there, I'd say. Uh, with Byron Saxton, uh, he was pretty much uh, at this time, he was uh, the commentator for uh, Monday Night Raw um, and SmackDown. So he was the commentator for the main roster. And then eventually, after the brand split, he would just become the commentator for Monday Night Raw. He was also the commentator, too, for NXT at the same time up until um the end of the year and uh then he would uh eventually um you know uh yeah just become the commentator for monday night war after the brand split then after the superstar shakeup he became the uh commentator for smackdown and booker t uh would continue to do the pre-show for a while until eventually uh earlier this year he ended up going back on commentary for uh monday night war after the superstar shakeup and then uh Corey Graves was the uh, heel commentator down at NXT for a while. Then after the WWE draft, he went on to uh, become the heel commentator for Monday Night Raw, as well as, um, you know, uh, NXT. Then when uh, WWE 205 Live aired, he became the heel commentator on 205 Live. Then in January, um, at NXT TakeOver San Antonio, he would commentate his final um, show for NXT. 
and now he just commentates for the uh, main roster on Wa and 205 Live. So, you know, all of those uh, um, announcers have gone pretty far. Then we had the commentary team of uh, JBL, Michael Cole, and Jerry the Kim Lawler. And, um, yeah, uh, JBL was the heel commentator on the main roster at the time, and he still is to this day. But then after the um, brand split, he went on to become the heel com commentator of uh, SmackDown, but, and he still is to this day. And uh, as for Michael Cole, he uh, is still pretty much in the same spot, except he's just the play-by-play -play guy for um, after Monday Night Raw after the brand split. And then Jerry the Kim Lawler um, this, uh, was doing commentary only for SmackDown at this time. And then eventually he became the... Uh, in 2016, he became the heel commentator on SmackDown, and then he would just be he would be taken off commentary for the pay per views, and he would be um, go on the panel. Uh, he would take Byron Saxton's place um, on the panel for the uh, pay per views, and um, then eventually uh, he ended up being taken off commentary permanently. He would be uh, on the pre show for uh, um, Monday Night Raw and uh, SmackDown, and um, then when the pre shows went away. Pretty much Jerry the Kim Lawler uh, really wasn't utilized all that much. I'm not really sure if he still is under contract with WWE, but I know he still does a few appearances. Um, he recently just did commentary for the uh, Royal Rumble match at the Royal Rumble pay-per-view um, in 2017, which is this year. And uh, he also um, did um, uh, hosted the Hall of Fame this year, and then he came back and commentated... Um, a match at uh, WrestleMania 33. Um, so he's still, I guess, doing some stuff with WWE, but just not as much. When you do hear him on commentary, though, I definitely do miss uh, Jerry the Kim Lawler on commentary. So I definitely do miss him. Um, but yeah, that's all the commentators and stuff. And now let me get to the actual matches on the show. We have um, the pre-show match. It's a... Um, Battle of the um, battle uh, for the crown match. Um, then we have um, on the actual show itself, we have a match between uh, Randy Orton and Sheamus. We have a WWE Tag Team Championship match. Um, we have a match between Bray Wyatt and Randy Orton. Um, then we have a Divas Triple Threat match between uh, Charlotte, um, Brie Bella, and uh, Sasha Banks. Uh, we have a, a United States Championship match between uh, John Cena and Kevin Owens. And then we have the, the main event. It's a WWE World Heavyweight Championship match between uh, Brock Lesnar and uh, Seth Rollins. And that's pretty much um, the uh, entire code. Um, now let me actually talk. And actually, if you look, if you uh, hear, listen... Actually, I didn't even mention what the WWE Tag Team Championship match was. I'm sorry. Uh, the WWE Tag Team Championship match is between uh, the Prime Time Players and the New Day. I forget which members of it it is. So, just give me a second. It's between the New Day and uh, Big E and Xavier. It's Big New Day members, Big E and Xavier Wood. I'm sorry, I just completely zoned out when I um, announced that. But yeah, so now let me talk. But if you listen to that card, that actually sounds like a pretty good card for a pay-per-view. Uh, but now let me actually talk about the actual build-up to this show itself. Um, so for the uh, United States Championship match uh, between John Cena and Kevin Owens, uh, the reason why this match was happening was because uh, at WrestleMania 31, John Cena had uh, won the United States Championship and... Um, after he won that championship, he talked about how the United States Championship was a symbol of excellence. Um, and he felt like it deserved to be fought by the best and everyone deserved an opportunity at it. So he would offer uh, the John Cena U.S. Open Challenge where anybody could come out and, uh, and uh, wrestle him uh, for the United States Championship. And, um, you know, eventually um, in May of uh, 2015, uh, Kevin Owens made his main roster 
WWE debut, but he had been running roughshod down in NXT for a while. He ended up, uh, he was at the time the current NXT champion, and he was one of the superstars that accepted John Cena's United States Championship over challenge, but he had no interest in actually wrestling for his title since he already had a championship. He just wanted to make a statement. So he ended up uh, laying out John Cena, and this led to a match at Elimination Chamber where it was Kevin Owens' first match on the main roster, and Kevin Owens ended up defeated John Cena clean as a whistle. Um, no, no bullshit. None of that. And, uh, yeah, it, it pretty much uh, made Kevin Owens look really strong. You know, nobody had ever really beaten John Cena fair and square before. Kevin Owens was the one, one of the few superstars that could say that they did that. And this instantly elevated Kevin Owens for about two weeks. Because uh, then what happened was uh, two weeks later at Money in the Bank... They had a rematch, and this actually too was huge. Was huge buzz for NXT because the NXT champion came up and defeated John Cena on the main wall. So it was huge for NXT, and it actually really got NXT to be talked about. But like I said, this lasted about two weeks. Kevin Owens had all the momentum in the world, and then at Money in the Bank, two weeks later, John Cena won the rematch, where John Cena should not have won the rematch. Um, you know, it actually looked like John Cena. Because one of the problems is with John Cena is he always had to get his win back, and that was the case what happened. And, you know, I, I would be fine if Cena won uh, Cena win in the Wii match, but Kevin Owens didn't even get to live off that victory for two weeks. He only got to live off that victory for two weeks. He couldn't even live off that victory a whole month. And it was just it's just kind of that notion that John Cena always had to get that win back. It was stupid. And then they made Kevin Owens kind of look like a sore loser by having him uh, lay out Cena and hit in the apron power bomb when they could have just had him beat Cena at Money in the Bank, and um, you know solidified that he was uh, the guy. But Kevin Owens, um, you know, talked about how John Cena was being a sore winner because he showed disrespect by telling Kevin Owens that he showed that he belonged in WWE uh, when he he said that was something that he already knew. So Kevin Owens wanted to have. Um, one more match with John Cena at Battleground for the United States Championship uh, since he had a, a pinfall victory over Cena, um, to which uh, John Cena ended up accepting. He even talked about, you know, how um, he how the, U, how the United States Championship was a symbol of excellence and um, how John Cena, um, you know, wanted to um, make sure did not want to lose that title to a scumbag like Kevin Owens, who has no pride for the fans. Uh, Kevin Owens said that it's right. That U.S. title is a symbol of his excellence, and he said that he's taken that U.S. title. And then at uh, Beast in the East, Kevin Owens ended up losing his NXT championship, so Kevin Owens became as desperate as ever to want to win that United States championship. And after and after a while, John Cena kept, um, kept trying to offer uh, U.S. Open challenges. But... Um, he would, Kevin Owens would continuously interrupt him, saying that no one was going to uh, take um, the United States Championship from Cena except for him. And then this kind of led us to the match at Battleground, where it was a must-win situation for Kevin Owens, because Kevin Owens really needed to win this match to really make himself a viable um, star in the WWE. You know, John Cena had been burying so many stars. In his time at the top in the WWE, was John Cena going to put out, uh, going to put over Kevin Owens a second time? Um, only I will let you know, um, you know, um, when I review that match. So that's the build up to that match. A pretty decent build up would have changed some things, you know. Obviously, like with Kevin Owens losing that match the second time, I quite frankly wouldn't even had the second match. Um, I would have probably um, hauled off the rematch, have Kevin Owens, you know, have John Cena want the rematch, and Kevin Owens has no interest in the rematch since he's already beaten Cena. He already has his prize, and he'll go back down in NXT. Uh, but one thing I do respect about Kevin Owens at this time is he did a lot of work um, in 2015 when he first came in. He was working down in NXT and on the main roster and high caliber feuds all at the same time. And I don't think you're ever going to find a superstar that's going to ever do that ever again. So, And then we had the build-up for the feud between uh, Roman Reigns and uh, Roy Wyatt. Uh, the reason why this match was happening was because uh, Roman Reigns at Money in the Bank 2015 was just about to win the Money in the Bank ladder match where it would have guaranteed him um, a WWE World Heavyweight Championship match up to one year. However, Bray Wyatt ended up, ended up costing him that match. Um, 
and screwing over Roman Reigns. Um, so Roman Reigns, so the match was made for Battleground. Roman Reigns, though, wanted answers about why Bray Wyatt cost him the money in the bank ladder match. And pretty much Bray Wyatt had talked about how, um, you know, uh, how he felt like Roman Reigns was taking his spot in the WWE. He felt like that he should have been the superstar that was climbing that ladder about to win the money in the bank contract. Um, and he says that anybody, and he was talking about how he wants anybody to win that match but Roman Reigns. Um, and he wants, and he says that he's sick of all this Roman Reigns propaganda. So he, he would kill, Bray Wyatt would constantly be playing mind games with Roman Reigns um, during his matches. He would distract him and cost him matches. Um, he would uh, have Roman Reigns would chase after him, and uh, you know he would spray he would uh, spray paint on the wall anyone but you Roman, uh, and that was his whole catchphrase on this was anybody but Roman, um, anyone but you Roman, and you know Roman he even fooled Roman Reigns and attacking a, someone that was dressed up like him, and Bray Wyatt had laid out Roman Reigns on numerous occasions. It looked like he was getting inside the head of Roman Reigns. Roman Reigns had even talked about how he is going to beat him at Battleground, but he wasn't even sure himself if it was going to be enough. So, um, eventually, um, Roman Reigns would get the upper hand on Bray Wyatt on the go-home show episode of Raw, where Roman Reigns would uh, attack Bray Wyatt and send him packing and stand tall. So this kind of set us to the into motion here. Obviously, this view, I think, was kind of like a way for the internet fans to kind of have their say because this was at a time where they were really shoving Roman Reigns down our throats, and we didn't really want to hear see Roman Reigns get a push. You know, they they fought, they had forced Roman Reigns down on us, and everybody didn't want to, um, Roman Reigns to be the new guy. So that was kind of I think what a, a rib for the storyline. Um, and then we had the build up to the uh, Randy Orton Sheamus match. Um, the reason why this match was happening is Randy Orton and Sheamus have had past feuds with before. When Sheamus first came into WWE in 2009 and had won the WWE Championship, they wrestled for the WWE Championship at the Royal Rumble in 2010, and they had a pretty and they had uh, some feuds in 2010 over the title. You know, they wrestled at SummerSlam for the championship. Uh, they wrestled um, in a six-pack elimination in a six-pack six elimination match um, at United Champions. They wrestled in a Hell in a Cell match at Hell in a Cell for the title, and then. Um, they had some matches in 2011, and then they kind of started to, you know, then they uh, came back and had some matches with each other here. Sheamus had just turned heel. He had come back the night after WrestleMania 31 and had turned heel and really reinvented himself. And Randy Orton and Sheamus got involved in, ball, um, in, in some massive brawls, um, and then eventually Sheamus would win the Money in the Bank ladder match. He ended up taking out Randy Orton and costing him a match on Raw, and Randy Orton retaliated by beating the hell out of Sheamus, and this kind of led us to this match. Randy Orton and Sheamus never really clicked with each other when it came to feuds. They never really had the best reasons, and this feud really didn't have anything going for it. It just, um, you know, felt like something for Sheamus to do and felt like something for Randy Orton to do. So that's what I thought. Then we had the build-up to the uh, WWE Tag Team Championship match. Uh, the reason why this match was happening was because um, uh, the New Day had uh, formed a faction. Um... In late 2014, they tried to get him over as baby faces first, but the fans didn't want to cheer for the New Day. They started, they hated on the New Day. They would chant New Day sucks. So they flipped the script and turned him heel because they realized they weren't getting over his faces, which was a smart decision. They ended up winning the WWE Tag Team Championships um, at Extreme Rules 2015. And then, uh, you know, uh, around this time, the primetime players... Uh, you know, we formed their tag team. They had been broken up, but then Titus O'Neil saved Darren Young uh, from a beatdown. So they ended up reforming as a tag team. Both teams competed in the first ever uh, WWE Tag Team um, Championship Tag Team Elimination Chamber match at Elimination Chamber, where uh, they were the final two teams, the last in the match. And the New Day ended up prevailing and um, defeating the primetime players and retaining their championships. But the primetime players wanted to win those WWE Tag Team Championships. So at Money in the Bank, they ended up win, winning the WWE Tag Team Championships. Um, and this was pretty much the New Day's rematch clause for the titles. And that's kind of the whole reason this feud was happening. Not the best reason for this feud, but whatever. Um, and then uh, even on this pre-show, 
you know, when the, uh, the panel, uh, the, the memos are talking about it, uh, the, uh, the New Day come up and talk about how they're going to win the WWE Tag Team Championships, and Corey Graves asks them, uh, what are they going to do, what's going to change tonight, than what, than what happened at Battleground. The New Day talked about how they were attacked during the Money in the Bank ladder match before that match, and that led to them losing. So they say that they're going to uh, win the um, WWE Tag Team titles tonight. They start doing the New champ. Uh, the New Day Rocks chance. Yeah, and the New Day started to really get over his heroes, and they were start slowly becoming the most interesting thing uh, in the WWE. I wasn't really digging the New Day. I didn't really dig the shtick at the time, but event, uh, eventually I would, and I can kind of see at the time now, watching it back, where the appeal is. Uh, so, yeah. And then we had the build-up for the uh, Divas match. Uh, the reason why this match was happening was because uh, uh, the Bella Twin... Um, you know, um, were pretty much running rough shot over the Divas division, um, and they were pretty much the eye candy of the Divas division. And Paige did everything that she could, um, and to um, you know, try to take down the Bella Twins. She tried to recruit from help and start a revolution, and uh, nobody was seemed interested in helping her. Alicia Fox ended up joining up with the Bella Twins and forming Team Bella. And, you know, Naomi and Tamina Snuka would try to take down um, Team Bello as well, but they would fail time in and time out. And um, eventually on the Go Home Show episode of War, um, Stephanie McMahon announced that she wanted to see a Divas revolution because at this time, women's sports was going through a revolution. She wanted WWE Divas to do the same thing. So they put, she pretty much hot-shotted a revolution just like that, just out of the blue, out of nowhere. And, you know, she called up uh, Charlotte, uh, Becky Lynch, and um, Sasha Banks, who Sasha Banks at the time was the uh, NXT Women's Champion. But she called all of them up from NXT. Uh, Paige, Becky Lynch, and Charlotte ended up forming a faction. Uh, t and then uh, Sasha Banks, uh, Naomi, and Tamina Snuka ended up forming a faction called um, Team Bad, which, stands for, which stood for uh, Beauty and Dominance. Um and, you know, all the NXT women ended up uh, taking out um, Team Bella, which was really damn cool, actually. But, obviously, this uh, uh, Divas Revolution went the completely one way. You know, they uh, ended up... Uh, Charlotte was the only one that really should have been called up for this at first, anyways. Because she, her story pretty much was done in NXT. You had Becky Lynch, who was just really starting to get her foot in down in NXT. And they called her up and kind of cut the... Uh, Rug out from underneath her. She could have done some great work down in NXT for a few more months. You had Sasha Banks, who hadn't even dropped the NXT Women's title yet, and you're having her get caught up in the main roster. That was ridiculous. You had them all join up in factions. That was ridiculous. Um, and it de they definitely tried to show that they were they cared about the Divas division. In due time, it does happen. I'll talk about the aftermath when I get there. But um, it really just didn't... Um, yeah, they just kind of think, I think, watched it too soon. It should have been more of a slow thing. So, yeah, um, that's about it for that. Uh, before I get into the build-up to the WWE World Heavyweight Championship match, I want to talk about the pre-show match itself. Um, we have uh, the battle for the crown match, Ken What's Up versus Ken Barrett. Uh, the reason why this match was happening was because Ken Barrett had won the Ken of the Win tournament to earn the right to be called Ken Barrett um, at the Ken of the Win special itself. He ended up defeating... Um, one of the opponents he ended up defeating was all truth in the uh, semifinals. So that kind of ties in. You know, Ken Barrett kept calling himself a kid. Um, all truth kept knocking him off in matches. And they eventually started doing this whole comedy shtick with, um, you know, um, um, yeah, they ended up uh, talking. Uh, they ended up, uh, since, Ken, uh, what's up, but uh, he was a better king because he was more of the people, and it was pretty much a comedy stick, his crown was like something that you would, would that look, looked like a Burger King crown, and his scepter was a toilet plunger, it was really goofy comedy, he cuts a lame promo too, talking about how he feels like he's royalty, um, even though he doesn't look it, it was stupid, Ken Barrett cut a great promo talking about the prestige of the King of the Ring, how Hall of Famers have won it, and how it'd be going on to be world champions, and how our true and now Ken What's Up was making a joke about it. And yeah, it makes Ken Barrett sound like the babyface, but he wasn't. So whoever would win this match, though, would be 
uh, would be um, would be uh, the kin of the wind. You know, Ken Barrett was pretty much defending his crown in this match. Uh, the match was all right. Um, you know, our truth started off doing really well in the match. He ended up dominating the first half of it. He had an atomic drop and a clothesline outside the wind onto uh, Ken Barrett. Ken, what's up? Ended up hitting a, uh, um, a dive on the outside. And then Ken Barrett hit a big boot um, in the wind. Um, and then uh, he ended up dominating the match for a while. He had a big boot while uh, Ken What's Up was tied up in the ropes. He had a kick to the ribs while he's, he was trapped on the top turnbuckle. Um, eventually, Ken What's Up started to make his comeback. He had a drop kick. Um, he hit. He uh, ended up hitting the scissors kick, covered Barrett. Barrett kicked out. And then uh, Ken Barrett uh, hit a uh, wind to change, covered him. Ken What's Up kicks out. Then he goes for the bull hammer elbow. Ken What's Up reverses it into a wall up. Barrett kicks out. Ken What's Up goes for the uh, pay dirt, or the little Jimmy, as he likes to call it, but I like to call it the pay dirt because that's the name of the move. Um, but Ken Barrett uh, holds on to the ropes, and then Ken Barrett hits the ball handle elbow for the win, and he retains his crown as Ken of the win. Nothing special, really. All the, nothing really all that special about this match at all. It didn't really. Uh, it was an all right match, but yeah, it was a lame feud that really was unneeded. Um, and the aftermath, you know, uh, Ken What's Up. Pretty much is in the same spot of the company. He's now back to just being our truth now. And, you know, he's pretty much in a comedy role still. And he really hasn't done all that much in the WWE. You have Ken Barrett, who ended up uh, pretty much... He was pretty much a job at this point. Um, Ken Barrett could have been so much to this company. Uh, they, they could have easily made him a star, but they chose not to. Eventually, he ended up, uh, you know... Um, just kind of floundering around and as a job of lower mid card guy. And then eventually he ended up uh, getting released from WWE in 2016. I believe he was released in like May, but it, it had been rumored that he was going to get released anyways. And we haven't seen much of him since then. So um, no one really benefited from this match uh, long term wise. So this match really is nothing. And then we have the final thing I want to talk about. We have, we have the build up to the uh, WWE World Heavyweight Championship match between. Uh, Brock Lesnar and uh, Seth Rollins. Uh, the reason why this match was happening was because uh, Seth Rollins, you know, aligned himself with the authority um, in May of 2014 uh, because uh, he aligned himself with Triple H so that way he could get to the top of the WWE. Triple H saw the future in Seth Rollins. Um, then, um, you know, uh, Seth Rollins... Um, ended up winning the uh, Money in the Bank ladder match at Money in the Bank 2014. And uh, he would, uh, you know, uh, go on. Um, yeah, so he ended up winning the Money in the Bank ladder match. They were teasing this match for a while. You know, Seth Rollins, uh, you know, uh, while Brock Lesnar was facing Cena for the WWE World Heavyweight Championship and Night of Champions, he got involved in that match and tried to cash in the contract on Lesnar, but he failed. And uh, then uh, they teased the match, you know, then a couple of weeks later, uh, Paul Heyman, uh, who's Brock Lesnar's advocate, confronted Seth Rollins about it, and, you know, they buried the hatchet for a while. Uh, they kind of formed a little bit of an alliance, and then eventually uh, uh, Seth Rollins and Brock Lesnar butted heads when they were building up to the triple threat match with Cena for the WWE World Heavyweight Championship, where Seth Rollins laid him out with a curb stomp, and Brock Lesnar wanted to get his hands on Seth Rollins then. Um... But Seth Rollins would escape. They had a fantastic, uh, fantastic little um, outing together um, with the triple threat match at the Royal Rumble, uh, where Lesnar and uh, you know Rollins ended up really just and Cena all tore the house down. And Lesnar ended up just pinning Seth Rollins to retain his WWE World Heavyweight Championship. But then finally, what what really got the feud going was at WrestleMania 31 in the main event, while Brock Lesnar was defending. Um, his WWE World Heavyweight Championship against Roman Reigns. Uh, Seth Rollins cashed in his Money in the Bank contract while the match was going on, um, and it turned the match into a triple threat match, and he ended up winning the match by pinning Roman Reigns and stole uh, the WWE World Heavyweight Championship from Brock Lesnar. Brock Lesnar was irate about this. He wanted his rematch uh, the, night, the next night on Monday Night Raw, but Seth Rollins refused to give him his rematch. So Brock Lesnar went ballistic. He took out everybody. And he um, Stephanie McMahon ended up indefinitely suspended Brock Lesnar. Um, so Seth Rollins, while Lesnar was suspended, 
um, you know, Seth Rollins ended up uh, having um, some solid WWE uh, World Heavyweight Championship um, defenses, and he was really starting to get gain some momentum. So the authority thought that they should throw another opponent at him. Seth Rollins claimed that he was getting really good. He was doing some really good stuff. You know, uh, he was kind of, they were kind of, having some tension with it. He was having some attention with the, in the authority. He claimed that he could, uh, you know, win matches all on his own. So then the authority, uh, we're going to rename his new opponent, uh, for battleground. And it ended up being Brock Lesnar. He got reinstated by WWE. What they kind of suck about him getting reinstated is they just randomly brought him back. I kind of would have preferred that it be a little bit more of an interesting story where he just comes in and fucks up Seth Rollins doing one of his WWE world heavyweight championship defenses. Now that I kind of look back at it, but whatever, Brock Lesnar ended up being brought back into the fold, and it was set that battleground that it was going to be Brock Lesnar uh, versus Seth Rollins. So Seth Rollins got worried about this. Um, so Brock Lesnar, but then Brock Lesnar, you know, talk, kept talking about how Seth Rollins stole his WWE World Heavyweight Championship and how Seth Rollins was a weasel. And, um, you know, Paul Heyman and Brock Lesnar talked about how Lesnar's going to win back his WWE World Heavyweight Championship. So Seth Rollins wanted to recruit help from members of the authority. Um, and, you know, he apologized to them for thinking that his ego was too big. Uh, because pretty much he knew that if he went and wrestled Brock Lesnar by himself, he would get destroyed. So, um, yeah, at first it looked like the authority weren't going to forgive his apology. So he ended up leaving. So Brock Lesnar came in. He tried, he, he was uh, destroying uh, to destroy Seth Rollins. But then the authority ended up helping Seth Rollins. They all, they all beat down Brock Lesnar and completely laid him out. And, um, you know, Seth Rollins, the authority were back together again. And Seth Rollins wanted to repay him. He gave J&J security, um, you know, um, an expensive car. Um, he gave corporate Kane um, an all-expense vacation to Hawaii. And it looked like everything was going to be good. The authority was starting to dominate the roster again. But then Brock Lesnar, you know, Brock Lesnar and Paul Heyman were pissed. And Paul Heyman and Brock Lesnar were talking about how there are things you don't do in the Ten Commandments. But then there's a level of the commandment that says, Thou shalt not provoke the beast. And, um, yeah. So then uh, Brock Lesnar said that um, he, they, he, he is going to take his title from Seth Rollins at Battleground. But he's going to take down everybody um, that is helping Seth Rollins. So that way it's down to a one-on-one -on -one match at Battleground. So then he started off on Raw. He destroyed the call that uh, he gave to J&J uh, &J Security and ended up taking out J&J &J Security. He broke Jamie Noble's arm and he ended up taking out uh, Joey Mercury. So J&J &J Security were out of the picture. And then um, uh, during the, on the Go Home Show episode, and he ended up destroying the call. And on the Go Home Show episode on Monday Night Raw, uh, during the contract signing, uh, Seth Rollins, um, you know, um, and Brock Lesnar, Seth Rollins have talked about how he was going to thrive in Suplex City and end up t tearing it down. Uh, and then Rollins and Corporate Kane tried to get the jump on Lesnar and attack him. Um, but then Brock Lesnar was able to fight him off. He ended up taking out Corporate Kane by f 5 him on the floor and injuring his ankle when he hit him with the steel steps while his ankle was on the bottom of him. So th then it was pretty much just down to a one-on-one -on -one match. Brock Lesnar, Seth Rollins, the battleground. Seth Rollins was going to have no help. So the question is, is how was Brock Lesnar... Now, how was Seth Rollins going to be able to prevail against Brock Lesnar at Battleground uh, with absolutely no help? And that's pretty much the entire pre-show. Uh, the pre-show was decent. Um, I like the New Day segment where they ended up invading it. They even did a Paul Heyman Q&A segment where he answered quest answered questions. You know, uh, Tom Phillips uh, was the one conducting, and obviously Tom Phillips ended up uh, just becoming a scumbag. He was the guy that we ended up hosting the social media lounge. Then he became the play-by-play -play commentator in NXT. Uh, then he went on to be the play-by-play -play commentator for SmackDown and 205 Live for a while. And then he sends pictures um, of himself on the airplanes um, saying that he's going to face fuck people and screws people out of their jobs. But now he doesn't do commentator for 205 Live or NXT. He just does commentary for SmackDown and the uh, SmackDown exclusive pay-per-view. So that's good to hear. Uh, it's less time I have to. It's less that I have to hear of him, but still too much. And many Tom Phillips commentary is too much for me. So then, um, yeah. So then, uh, yeah. But he ended up asking. But you know, uh, WWE uh, fans were able to tweet uh, Paul Heyman questions. One of them was, "What is Brock Lesnar's daily routine before a match?" 
and he says that he eats, sleep, conquer, later on tonight, conquers and repeats, and he gets asked how many suplexes it would take for, uh, you know, um, Brock Lesnar to defeat Seth Rollins. Paul Heyman says that, uh, you know, it's going to take, Brock Lesnar will deliver as many suplexes as he feels that it t takes uh, to de permanently victimize and defeat Seth Rollins. And then he gets asked, what if Seth Rollins were to defeat uh, Brock Lesnar? Would he be to consider the new beast? But before Heyman lets him finish that question, Paul Heyman says that he doesn't go by what ifs, he goes by absolutes. And he talks about how Brock Lesnar is going to absolutely destroy Seth Rollins and take the WWE World Heavyweight Championship from him. And then that was the end of uh, the Q&A, pretty much the end of the pre-show. Um, like I said, overall, I thought the pre-show pre was all right. thought it had some decent stuff on it. The match, the pre-show match was all right. Uh, the New Day segment where they ended up interrupting the pre-show was pretty was was pretty good. Uh, Paul Heyman's Q and A I thought was fantastic. Anytime Paul Heyman talks, it's just fantastic. And yeah, the way they just talk, structured it, I thought was pretty decent. So I, overall, I thought the pre-show was all right. Okay, so now on to the actual show itself. We had the same people on commentary. I thought they did a pretty all right video package. They've done better video package, but this one was all right. We had the first match on the show. It was a uh, Sheamus versus Randy Orton. Uh, all right, first match here. Randy Orton and Sheamus have always not had the best matches together, but this is one of the better matches they've had. is isn't saying much. Uh, for some reason, it just seems like when Randy Orton and Sheamus get in the win together, though, they just don't really click. Uh, in this, but on this match, but in this match, they did click. Um, they start chain wrestling each other. Sheamus takes down Orton with a shoulder tackle, and then Randy Orton takes down Sheamus with on himself. Randy Orton goes on the offense on Sheamus. He throws him into the barricade. He beats the crap out of him, uh, but then he puts it back in the wind. Sheamus tries to escape. Orton takes his head off with a clothesline. Um, and, uh, you know, Randy Orton really dominates and controls Sheamus, but then eventually Sheamus gains control by hitting two Irish Kush backbreakers on Orton, and uh, he goes for um, He dominates the matchup for a little bit. He goes for a third Irish Kush backbreaker. Randy Orton counters it. He starts hitting it with Wailing away with right hand. Sheamus takes him down with an axe handle. He goes off his uh, second turnbuckle and hits a, um, a double knees to the face. He kind of just starts wailing down Orton. Um, and, you know, he pretty much just dominates, you know, does some nice simple wrestling moves like headlocks and some more knee drops and stuff. And then eventually uh, Randy Orton um, is able to get, um, is able to uh, move out of the way when Sheamus goes to hit a one and shoulder tackle in the corner. And she, Orton moves out of the way, and Sheamus goes shoulder first into the post. He falls out of the win. They both start trading right hands towards each other. Uh, Randy Orton starts to make his comeback. He goes for the scoop slam, but Sheamus knows that it's coming since they've wrestled so many times. So it, Sheamus just stands on the ropes, and Orton starts to go on the attack on Sheamus. Uh, he clotheslines him out of the win. He hits a back suplex onto the uh, announcer's table. Then he hits a scoop slam on him anyways. Um, covers him, Sheamus kicks out, and then he goes for the uh, draping DDT, um, but then Sheamus pains him up on the top rope, um, and um, he uh, hits a um, flying shoulder tackle off the top turnbuckle, uh, covers him, Orton kicks out, um, he hits a rolling senton, Orton kicks out, Randy Orton hits a T-bone suplex, Sheamus kicks out, and uh, then uh, Randy Orton hits the uh, draping DDT, um, but Sheamus still kicks out. He goes for the RKO. Sheamus turns it into a roll up. Orton kicks out, and then Sheamus hits the ball kick on him. Uh, but then Sheamus is too weak to make the cover. So once he gets to his feet, Randy Orton's holding onto the ropes, and Sheamus gets him into a uh, uh, clover leaf. And Randy Orton tries to get to the ropes, but Sheamus pulls him back the first time, and then the second time uh, Randy Orton gets him to, gets to the ropes, and yeah. Uh, he was in this move for a while, so I liked that. Then afterwards, then uh, after this, uh, Wefrey has to pull Sheamus off. After this, Sheamus goes to lift up Orton, but then Orton hits an AKO on him for the win, and Randy Orton wins the match. Don't get really what Randy Orton had to gain from winning this matchup. I think Sheamus needed the victory more since he was the uh, Money in the Bank contract holder. Um, you know, uh, this is just something I really don't understand still, why they do this with their Money in the Bank contract holders. Uh, they'll give him the money in the bank briefcase, and then they'll just go on a tremendous losing streak. And the same thing kind of happened with Sheamus. You know, he really didn't win many matches with the briefcase. So I didn't really get why they uh, had him lose. And I don't get why they do this with the money in the bank contract holders. But obviously, you know, you had the aftermath. Um, but yeah, like I said, though, 
Um, I thought this was a uh, all white match here. You know, not the greatest match, but an all white opening match here, pretty decent. Um, the aftermath is they would continue this feud. Uh, Randy Orton would cost Sheamus um, his chance to cash in the contract, uh, well, at least attempt to cash in the contract. Um, on an episode of Raw, Sheamus would cost Randy Orton a match for the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. And then, uh, you know, they would have another match at SummerSlam where Sheamus would win. And then uh, they would have a blow-off match on an episode of Raw where Randy Orton would win. And then Randy Orton pretty much was taken off the TV until, uh, you know, to the, um, the next year's Battleground because of uh, injuries. So he was out of action for a while. And then um, he would come back. He, you know, um, he would have... Um, his feud with Brock Lesnar, he would uh, they would have the match at SummerSlam where Randy Orton would lose, and then um, he would get into a feud with Bray Wyatt. Uh, he would win the WWE Championship um, at WrestleMania 33, and then uh, he lost it at Backlash. I'm not going to say who it was because the guy sucks. And as for uh, Sheamus, he went on to um, you know eventually cash in his Money in the Bank contract and win the WWE World Heavyweight Championship from Roman Reigns at Survivor Series and. You know, he ended up uh, losing the title um, the night after on on episode of War, and then uh, he pretty much uh, didn't uh, you know uh, didn't really um, go much of anywhere really afterwards. He was in um, a faction for a while um, with Ken Barrett uh, that didn't really last too long, and then uh, once that faction ended, he kind of floundered a little bit. Um, then eventually, uh, you know, uh, he now eventually formed a tag, uh, now is in the tag team division. Um, you know, uh, he's now, he since then, uh, he's been a two-time uh, WWE Raw Tag Team Champion. Um, and uh, he's actually one now of the current one half of the uh, Raw Tag Team Champions. So, uh, yeah, Sheamus decently benefited from this match. Nobody really would have benefited though, because these were already established superstars. So, but uh, really, but Sheamus, I think, if would have benefited more by winning this match for gain, because he would have gained momentum. So, and still, this they really just shouldn't have even put the money in the bank briefcase on Sheamus. There was really no reason for him to hold it. Uh, it was kind of lame and stupid. I understand they wanted to create like a top heel and stuff. It just Sheamus wasn't that guy, so it was stupid. Uh, but overall, I thought this was a. Uh, Pretty uh, decent open to matchup. Just I didn't really care for the feud, and I didn't really care, uh, you know. Um, not uh, you know. I don't, I'm not. I, I'm not much of a Randy or Sheamus. I like uh, the decent wrestlers and stuff, but I'm not really like a big fan of those two. So whatever. Okay, so next, um, Stephanie McMahon gets interviewed by JoJo, JoJo, who's Bray Wyatt's uh, lover. Bray Wyatt loves that JoJo. Um, Stephanie McMahon kind of made fun of her in a way because she uh, comes up and she's like, you're kind of short now. I kind of made fun of her height. Obviously, I don't think she was being rude. It just, it was definitely something I think that was like a little bit of a shoot. It wasn't really supposed to be planned, but um, JoJo as an interview it was just terrible. Um, and then, uh, you know, um, Stephanie McMahon talks about how after everything that happened on Raw, she likes the fact that it happened because that's what the Divas Revolution is all about. And uh, she says that, you know, some of the biggest, ma biggest matches have happened, I forget exactly, um, in St. Louis, because where Battleground that year was being held. So uh, she said that uh, she wants the same thing for the Divas Revolution. So she asked each member um, of, the fa of each faction's... Uh, Sorry, I can't talk. She asked each member of uh, each faction um, to pick a representative to have a triple threat match tonight. Um, and uh, she says that they better choose wisely because we need to have the greatest matchups for the Divas Revolution. Uh, you know, I obviously, I didn't think this interview segment was all that bad. I still hate the fact that they kept saying Divas Revolution all the time. Divas Revolution, Divas Revolution. I'll talk about that more, though, when I actually cover the uh, Triple Threat match. Okay, so uh, next match was a WWE Tag Team Championship match. WWE Tag Team Champions, the Primetime Players, versus Kofi Kinston and Big E with Xavier Woods win side. And before the match, the New Day come out to cut a promo. And the New Day talk about 
you know, how they've always done the right things, um, and it's led them to on the road to success. Um, and they talk about how it's, they've had to go five long weeks without being the WWE Tag Team Champions. And they say that, uh, you know, uh, that if they always do the right thing, they can always pick up the pieces and put them together. And uh, the, Xavier Woods even talks about how uh, you all, just like at Money in the Bank, you have to lose at the you have to learn how to lose before you learn how to win. And they lost some money in the bank, and now they're ready to win. Um, and Big E says, because today is a new day. I thought they cut a really good promo, and it was really enjoyable. And we had the match itself. And I thought this was a uh, good WWE Tag Team Championship match here. Um, Darren Young and um, Kofi Kinston started off the matchup. Uh, Kofi Kinston hits like an amateur background splash on, on uh, Young. Covers him, uh, Young kicks out, and uh, they both kind of start chain wrestling each other for a little bit. Um, and, uh, you know, and then uh, Titus O'Neil gets tagged in, and um, they, um, he hits a, um, and Big E as he gets tagged in, and Big E, and Titus O'Neil hits a body slam on Big E, and uh, the primetime players hit, hit a suplex splash on Big E, covers him, Big E kicks out, and, um, then uh, Big E hits a wicked Irish whip, setting Darren Young over the top turnbuckle, and just crashing right on the floor. And yeah, one that I always loved about this is you could always hear as uh, Xavier Woods. This was when when he was in that heel manager role, would always talk really loud, and you could and you could just hear him, and he would be like a, very annoying. I thought that was uh, great stuff. And uh, yeah, Big E and Kobe Kinston dominating uh, Darren Young. Uh, Big E throws uh, Dale and Young into a uh, kick by Kofi. They hit, um, they both take turns hitting stomps on uh, Dale and Young, which is what they now call the Unicorn Stampede. And then Big E Irish whips uh, Kofi Kinson into Dale and Young, and he hits a drop kick on him, covers him. Young kicks out, and then uh, Kofi Kinson trips Dale and Young, um, and um, in the win, and then uh, he attacks him on the outside. And big um, and while he's on the apron, and then he tags in Big E. Big E hits a splash on Darren Young on the apron, which looks really sick. And uh, then uh, he covers him. Darren Young kicks out. And uh, then eventually Darren Young tries to get to his corner, but Big E just won't let him. Darren Young then hits an insecurity on Big E. And then Titus O'Neil gets the hot tag on Kofi. He starts going off on him. And he's about to put him away, but then Big E distracts the referee. Xavier Woods hits an insecurity to the back of the he head. And then Kofi hits the DDD on Titus O'Neil, covers him. Titus O'Neil kicks out. And uh, then um, Titus O'Neil takes out Kofi. Darren Young get, um, gets tagged in. And uh, he starts going off on Kofi and Big E. He hits a belly-to-belly uh, -belly throw. He uh, hits a forearm on Big E. He hits a back suplex onto the apron on Xavier Woods. Uh, Kofi tries to hit a dive on him, but Darren Young catches him with a right hand. And then he goes in the win. Kofi hits a heel kick on Darren Young. Covers them. Darren Young kicks out, and then the um, Kofi and Big E go for the uh, midnight hour. But Darren Young counters it. He hits a gut buster on, uh, and he sends Big E into the steel post. And then he uh, Kofi goes to jump on him anyways. Darren Young ducks, and then he hits a um, a gut check on Kofi. Titus O'Neil tags himself in, hits the clash of the Titus on Big E for the win, and the prime time play. Uh, and the primetime players retain their uh, WWE Tag Team Championships. Overall, I thought this was a, uh, you know, a good uh, WWE Tag Team Championship match. And it was good. <coughs> and obviously the aftermath came as they would continue this feud going into SummerSlam, where the New Written Day would finally defeat the primetime players in a four-way tag title match to uh, regain their WWE Tag Team Championships. And uh, the New Day pretty much would uh, become the best act in WWE of, uh, for about a year in 2015 and in the early part of 2016. Uh, they went on to, uh, you know, uh, do some really creative things. You know, Xavier Woods uh, would win out the trombone, which he calls Francesca. And uh, they, uh, do, the New Day would cut solid promo after solid promo. Uh, they would go on to few with top tag teams. Uh, for the WWE Tag Team Championships and have solid WWE Tag Team Championship de title defenses. Um, 
They uh, have they went on to have Bootios, which is the shirt that I'm wearing now, which is their brand new cereal box. And eventually, uh, at Fast Lane 2016, um, they ended up turning the uh, New Day face, and the crowd really started to get behind the New Day. And um, you know, they would continue to hold on to the WWE Tag Team Championships. And meanwhile, t- um, the Prime Time players. Uh, they would get their rematch on Raw, on an episode of Raw for the WWE Tag Team Championships, but they wouldn't win. And then they eventually just disbanded the primetime players for no reason, and they ended up doing the wrong things as single stars. Titus O'Neil would have his, a decent face one, uh, but then eventually he was suspended for 60 days in uh, 2016 in February, which was really stupid. He ended up missing WrestleMania 32. Uh, the New Day... Um, you know, uh, had a big WrestleMania entrance where they came out of a Bootio cereal box. And then, um, what else? Uh, you know, uh, Darren Young competed in the uh, third annual um, Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. Um, and, um, you know, uh, Titus O'Neil and Darren Young did their thing as single stars. Titus O'Neil uh, got into a feud for the U.S. title, didn't win the U.S. championship. And then eventually, uh, after the brand split, him and Darren Young were both drafted to Raw. Uh, they did like a, uh, Darren Young did the whole make Darren Young great again thing. And then they got into a mini feud where Titus O'Neil ended up turning heel again. They had pretty awful matches together. Uh, so then they just eventually cut the feud. Titus O'Neil is now doing the Titus brand stuff. He originally started doing it as a heel, but then now he's turned face and he's starting to get some clients together. And then Darren Young ended up getting injured, so we haven't seen too much of him. As for the New Day, continuing with them. Yeah, so they went on to become the best w- um, act in WWE. They had solid WWE Tag Team Championship defenses. They had the WWE Tag Team Championships for a while. Then after the brand split, they were all uh, drafted to uh, Monday Night Raw. And, uh, you know, eventually the WWE Tag Team Championships um, are now called the uh, WWE Raw Tag Team Championships. And um, the New Day continued to hold on and successfully defend those Raw Tag Team Championships. And then eventually uh, in December, um, they went on to uh, break a record where they became the longest uh, tag team champions of any kind in WWE, which is a tremendous record. Not, not a lot of teams can say that they've broken that record. Broken that record. Um, but then eventually they went on to uh, lose the uh, um, WWE Raw Tag Team Championships at roadblock end of the line uh, to Sheamus and his tag team partner. And, um, you know, afterwards, the New Day kind of floundered around for a little bit. They became the host of WrestleMania 33. Um, didn't really do too much there. And then eventually, after the Superstar straight, after the Superstar shakeup, they were uh, um, drafted to SmackDown. And uh, then they, uh, you know, uh, are now fighting for the uh, SmackDown Tag Team Championships. And now fighting for them this year at Battleground uh, 2017. So, uh the New Day have become a huge team. They're probably one of the best ta- tag teams um, of this era. Um, and the New Day have done fantastic stuff as a team. You know, they've done great things, like have the, um, had great matches, had the Francesca stuff, and they've been able to go kind of outside the box uh, when it comes to the things that they've been able to do. They've, be, they, they've uh, are the longest great in, um, tag team champions of any kind in WWE. So I think the New Day out of this match has benefited. The primetime play is really not so much. Uh, I really don't ever understand why they broke up the primetime players really out of nowhere. It really doesn't make any sense to me, but whatever. But still, I thought this was a uh, good WWE Tag Team Championship match. Okay, so next, uh, Paige, Charlotte, and Becky Lynch are backstage, and Paige talks about how she's been begging for months for a revolution in the Divas Division, they finally have one. And to say to withdraw any concerns, um, she said that when she was brought up, they were brought up, when Stephanie McMahon brought them up to the main roster, uh, she was really excited about it. And Becky Lynch talks about um, how they're going to rebuild the Divas Division brick by brick and put the Divas on notice and even put the superstars on notice. And then Charlotte says that they're going to do it with Flair. They all put their pickies together and you know, it's like the secret handshake or whatever. Uh, all right, promo and stuff. The one thing, though, I've been meaning to say with this whole Stephanie McMahon when she brought the Divas Revolution up is 
it's kind of really weird how Stephanie McMahon acts like a face sometimes. Like, when, for example, um, when um, she's in New England uh, and she's in Boston or something, she puts over her home team. I get it's her home team, but why, But it's such a baby face thing to do when she's supposed to be a, like this big heel. I really hate when she does that. Um, a lot of people who are big, very big sport fans love it because obviously when the sports team gets called out, they, you know, obviously all logic goes out the window. But I always hate that when because I'm not like, you know, I don't really watch sports, but I'm not a sports fan. And I always hate it when the uh, that Stephen McMahon would phrase that sports team. Uh, so I really hate that. But whatever. This promo segment was all right. Um, obviously, like I said, I just never cared for the whole faction, faction, faction fiasco. It was stupid. Okay, so then we had the next match. It was uh, Boy Wyatt versus Roman Reigns. And I thought this was a really good match here. I'm just going to break it down and uh, give you like what my real thoughts on it were. So Roman Reigns and Boy Wyatt. Uh, tangle it up together. Boy Wyatt dominates a little bit in the match, and then Roman Reigns, you know, the match is really a brawl in the beginning. They both want to beat the hell out of each other. Uh, Roman Reigns gets the upper hand on Boy Wyatt. He throws him into the barricade, um, and, um, you know, then uh, Boy Wyatt gets the upper hand for a little bit on Roman Reigns. He uh, hits the uh, um, high cross body into like the forearm on him. He dominates the matchup for a while, but then Roman Reigns starts to get some offense going. He uh, hits a big clothesline on him. He throws Wyatt out of the ring. He goes to hit a spear on Wyatt. Wyatt reverses it and throws him into the steps. Um, and then Bray Wyatt starts to pick up how Roman Reigns. He um, hits a suplex into a senton on him. He hits, um, you know, he, uh, you know, um, um, he uh, hits punches in the corner. Then Roman Reigns goes for the uh, power bomb, but uh, because he's been hurt so much by Wyatt, he just can't hit the power bomb. So Wyatt then hits like a clothesline on him, and then Wyatt hits a DDT on the apron. Um, covers Reigns. Reigns kicks out. Then he just picks up Roman Reigns through a good portion of this matchup. Then Roman Reigns starts to make his comeback. He hits a couple of amateur background throws. Then he goes for, uh, for the apron drop kick, but Wyatt counters into a clothesline and hits a senton while he's on the outside. Um, throws him in the wing, covers him, Reigns kicks out. Then he starts punching him in the corner. No, then he goes for the superplex off the top turnbuckle, uh, but then Reigns counters into a power bomb, and this time he hits it, covers him. Wyatt kicks out. Then Reigns starts to uh, make um, his comeback again. He goes for the uh, Superman punch. Wyatt rolls out of the win. And then Reigns bounces him face first off the um, apron, hits an apron drop kick, and uh, then he puts him in the ring. Bray Wyatt takes his head off with a clothesline, uh, covers him. Um, Reigns kicks out. Then he go. Reigns hits a roll up on him, but then turns it into a Superman punch. Covers Wyatt. Wyatt kicks out, and then they both start really going back and forth. They both trade shots on the outside of the ring. And then uh, Bray Wyatt grabs two steel chairs, um, throws them into the ring. Well, he acts like he's going to use them, but then Reigns sees it. He attacks him. Reigns throws four steel chairs into the ring, and the referee's getting these chairs out of here. Luke Harper attack. Well, I just gave it away, but um, a mystery person in a hood attacks him. Reigns throws him into the post and hits a super kick on him. Then Bray Wyatt hits a Yoranagi, which he also hit earlier on Reigns in the match. Uh, with that he kicked out of, but he hits it on the apron this time, and then uh, he throws Reigns in the wind, hits the sister Abigail on him for the win, and then afterwards the hooded guy takes off his uh, jacket, and it's revealed to be a little couple that I just gave away earlier. I apologize for that, but you could clearly see that it is him, even if you didn't know, because uh, they you can totally see the beard underneath the hood. They don't do a very good job covering it up. Uh, but yeah, Bray, Luke Harper aligned himself back with Bray Wyatt, and they were slowly uh, starting to uh, reform the Wyatt family, and two-thirds of the Wyatt family were, formed, were reformed here, so that was cool. And I thought this was a really good um, match here. Um, I think, uh, like I said, with when it comes down with Roman Reigns, he doesn't have really all that bad of matches. I think it also definitely varies, too, on who he works with, because if he works with somebody that's better than him, he can have some really good matches. 
Uh, but if he works with someone that's the same talent level as him, he, the matches are either just passable or bad um, of itself. And I would say here he worked with someone that's better than him. I think Bray Wyatt's really good at telling a psychology, um, at psychology wrestling. He's really good at telling a story. And I think that's what really made this match. I thought Bray Wyatt looked really dominant in this match. Um, he dominated Reigns throughout the, um, the whole match. Really, a, like, 75% of it, I would say. Um, but I, I mean, I, and Bray Wyatt really needed to win this match. I think the reason I think I enjoyed this match watching it now than when I did two years ago was because I had a feeling that Bray Wyatt wasn't winning that match because of how behind they were on Roman Reigns. And Bray Wyatt, really, they just kind of killed a lot of his steam around this time. They had him lose his first feud to John Cena. Um, at, um, and then, uh, you know, he, really, he had lost his cult. He had gotten jobbed out um, to The Undertaker at WrestleMania when The Undertaker only showed up once, wrestled Wyatt, and then was gone afterwards. So uh, Bray Wyatt really needed to gain some momentum back. And this kind of helped it somewhat. But this didn't last long. You know, the night at, um, after this show... Roman Reigns and Bray Wyatt would continue their feud. Uh, they would have a tag, uh, you know, Reigns it, um, would pick a partner, and uh, they, uh, him and his partner would go on to defeat Luke Harper and Bray Wyatt at uh, SummerSlam. And then uh, at Night of Champions, the Wyatt family added a new member, so then Reigns and the same partner and um, another partner lost to the whole Wyatt family at Night of Champions. And then they finally blew off their feud, um, at Hell in a Cell, inside a Hell in a Cell match, um, where Roman Reigns would win, and yeah, Bray Wyatt had lost yet another feud, so then, um, Bray Wyatt ended up, and, uh, but then they weren't done, then, the, then, uh, later on that night, the Wyatt family would, would go on to attack, uh, Undertaker, they would do the whole feud with, uh, you know, the 25 years of Undertaker storyline, when Undertaker and Kane, the Brothers of Destruction, would reform to face, uh, Two members of the Wyatt family, which ended up being Bray Wyatt and Luke Harper, and which the Wyatt family would lose. Then they would uh, beat Team Extreme at uh, TLC, um, which stands for Tables, Ladders, and Chairs in 2015. And then, um, but, and that helped, and, but that didn't really up their credibility all that much. Then they all got eliminated from the Royal Rumble by Brock Lesnar. Um, and then Brock Lesnar, like, squashed Bray Wyatt and Luke Harper in, like, you know, um, under five minutes at Roadblock. Uh, the Wyatt family were bitched out again at WrestleMania the next year. And then uh, the Wyatt family was supposed to turn face. But then uh, Bray Wyatt got hurt by Roman Reigns. Fuck you, Roman. And so then that, that got pushed to the back burner. So then they returned. Um, and then uh, they feuded with the New Day going into Battleground the next year. Where the Wyatt family would beat them. Then after the brand split, uh, Bray Wyatt uh, was drafted to uh, SmackDown. Uh, Luke Harper actually wasn't drafted. He had gotten injured just before WrestleMania, so he wasn't drafted. Uh, Bray Wyatt went on to have a pretty lame feud with Randy Orton, to which Luke Harper would return and cost Randy Orton the match. Then they did that whole feud I just talked about with Randy Orton earlier in this video, uh, which ended up being really stupid. It led to that, uh, sh I didn't even mention, that shitty ho that shitty... Uh, House of Hoes match that they had um, at Payback 2017. Um, then Bray Wyatt just had a feud with Seth Rollins that was pretty lame. Uh, he ended up finally winning that feud, but you know, in the span of two years, Bray Wyatt's credibility pretty much isn't there. He lost all his credibility. Um, he never wins a feud, and yeah, he just isn't very significant. He cuts these promos that lead to no direction, which wasn't any different back then because going into the Roman Reigns feud, it was kind of the same thing. And it's really a shame to see what's happened with Bray Wyatt. Pretty much, there's no repair for his gimmick. There's just no, you can't, he, his character is just so damaged that you can't really repair it. As for Roman Reigns, um, like I said, after he blew off his feud with Bray Wyatt at Hell in a Cell, he was actually supposed to wrestle Seth Rollins for the WWE World Heavyweight Championship at Survivor Series. They were gearing up towards that. But then Seth Rollins ended up getting injured, so they had to push that on the back burner. So then um, instead, um, there was a tournament to the crown a new WWE World Heavyweight Champion. Uh, Roman Reigns would finally win the WWE World Heavyweight Championship at Survivor Series 
to which then I like I talked about Sheamus with cash in his money in the bank contract, lose it to Roman Reigns. Um, you know, um on Raw. Um and then um Roman Reigns would uh lose his WWE World Heavyweight Championship um at the Royal Rumble. He would uh you know become number one contender um by winning the triple threat match at Fast Lane. He defeated Triple H who what who beat him for the title at the Rumble in the main event to which he got booed out of the building. Uh, they pretty much forced Roman Reigns down our throats. They gave him the title twice before WrestleMania, which was stupid. And then he went on to have uh, to hold on to that WWE World Heavyweight Championship until uh, the return of Seth Rollins. Uh, they finally had the one-on-one match at Money in the Bank, where Seth Rollins ended up defeating Roman Reigns for the title. Then Roman Reigns ended up getting suspended. He returned to Battleground the very next year. Uh, after the WWE draft, Roman Reigns was drafted to Raw. Um... Roman Reigns since then has gone on to be United States champion. Um, and he held on to that championship up until January, uh, to which he ended up losing that championship. And then um, he's uh, wrestled for the WWE Universal Championship, which is now what his world championship is, um, a few times against Kevin Owens. And uh, he's gone on, and he was very, he was uh, unsuccessful. Uh, he ended up retiring The Undertaker this year um, at WrestleMania. And, yeah, that's about it. Um, and, yeah, currently he's uh, set to main event with Brock Lesnar in a Fatal 4 match for the WWE Universal Championship at SummerSlam this year. So, uh, Roman Reigns has obviously gone really far in this company. Uh, he's pretty much the top guy. He's pretty much going to be the next top face of the company. Even though everybody hates the guy, they've done so many heelish things with him, like retired the Undertaker at WrestleMania, um, and then uh, and yet he's still a baby face. And ever since WrestleMania 33, uh, I haven't willingly watched a Roman Reigns segment or match. Um, uh, you know of of the of the now. Um, I actually hadn't even watched uh, the last match I saw with him was his ma- ambulance match at Great Balls of Fire. Um, and, but that's not a match I paid for. That's a match that was on my friend's network. Um, and I didn't pay for that match. I don't pay to see Roman Reigns. I don't pay to see Roman Reigns. Uh, Waz coming up um, in August on August 13th here in, in TD Garden. And Roman Reigns is probably going to be on that show. I'm probably going to end up getting stuck paying for to see him then, which sucks. Um, but it is what it is. Um, when you buy a ticket, I don't pay to see Roman Reigns, though. I pay to see the WWE, so whatever. But overall, uh, Roman Reigns obviously benefited from this, but way wide, short-term-wise, obviously benefited from this because he got to look like a viable cont- opponent for Reigns for a while. But then long-term-wise, his character, like I said, is just so beyond repair. It sucks. Uh, but overall, that's pretty much um, it. But overall, this match is really good. Um and uh, obviously, the white person goes over. So, yeah. All right. So, um, next team bag gets interviewed, and uh, they get asked if uh, they get interviewed by JoJo, and they get asked if they're having trouble uh, picking um, which representative is going to represent their team in the triple threat match. And uh, Naomi's like, are you trying to cause trouble between? Uh, the members of Team Bad, it's no decision about who's going to be competing. And they talk about how uh, Na- uh, Tamina snuck as the muscle of Team Bad, Naomi's the Razzle and the Dazzle or something like that, and Sasha Banks is the NXT Women's Champion. And Sasha Banks then says that there's a reason that she's the boss of the WWE, and if you don't believe it yet, just watch me. And then they and then uh, they leave. Tamina Snucker gives like a weird look to JoJo, it was whatever. What I never understood is why when they brought in Sasha Banks, she was aligned with Naomi and Tamina Snuka. It just kind of felt like they wanted to get Sasha Banks on there, so why not just align them with them? And it was just like, I just never get why the WWE called all three Charlotte, Sasha Banks, and Becky Lynch up on the main roster at the same time. That's just a bad decision. This Divas Revolution at the time, it would start it off terrible. Um, it seemed, it seemed like the matches obviously now got better, but just the whole storyline of it just it was awful. This 
when they brought him up on these factions, it was awful. Like, I don't get why they decided to do that. You really kind of, it just really hurts Becky Lynch's momentum and stuff, but I'll talk about that more. Um, it, what also it makes me, reminds me is, I know I've talked about this before when I did my NXT special uh, review series, is how great of a heel and how much better of a heel Sasha Banks is than being a baby face. Like, they've just really ruined Sasha Banks character-wise on the main roster. Uh, she just really shouldn't be this baby face that's, you know, coming out, having fun, dancing around all the time. It's stupid, but whatever. Uh, overall, this interview segment was all right. All right, so now we had the next match. It was a triple threat Divas match. Um, it was uh, Charlotte with Paige and um, Becky Lynch inside versus Sasha Banks with uh, Naomi and Tamina Snucker inside versus what we thought was going to be Nikki Bella with Brie Bella and Alicia Fox inside. But... Nikki Bella decides that she's not wrestling, so she sends Wee Bella to go in there instead. So that was fine. Um, I thought this was a... I don't really want to say it was a good match, but it was a pretty solid match. I enjoyed it. Um, but it was... But yeah, it was a pretty solid match. Um, one thing that uh, def definitely did start to get better once this revolution, which is what the WWE so called it, was that you got longer diva matches... Um, but the problem with this match was the, there was no story behind it. The really, it was just really thrown together last minute. Um, but I'll talk about that. Let me break down this match first. So the match starts off, um, Brie Bella and Sasha Banks start to work together to take out Charlotte since they're both the heels in the match. Uh, Charlotte hit, but Charlotte's able to overcome it at first. But then, um, you know, Sasha Banks beats up Brie. And then uh, Charlotte and Sasha Banks are going to work together since the, the, they're two of the NXT call-ups. And, you know, you have the Bella, Team Bella who was dominated in the main roster. So I thought that made sense. But then Sasha's like, wait a minute. Let's you and me work together. And then she takes a cheap shot at Wee Bella, throws her out of the wind. And then the rest of the match is pretty much just down to uh, Sasha and Charlotte for a while. Uh, they both start doing chain wrestling moves to each other. Uh, she throws Charlotte out of the wind pretty, brood, pretty hard. Uh, she hits a double knees under both uh, Brie Bella and Charlotte. And um, then, um, yeah, Sa the match was just all Sasha. She uh, hits a wicked straight jacket neck breaker onto uh, Charlotte. She hits a, uh, she gets her into a wicked submission. She hits a wicked wall up on her. I thought that looked pretty cool. And then you have uh, Brie Bella. Um, she, uh, you know, hits the... Uh, uh, the Daniel Bryan yes kicks, um, and she and Charlotte tries to block it, but she slaps Charlotte right in the fucking face. Um, and then uh, Sasha Banks just ends up ducking it. Um, Charlotte makes her come back. She hits a neck breaker on sh um, Sasha Banks, and uh, she ends up doing a kick up right afterwards. And um, then Sasha Banks hits a double knees from the middle turnbuckle. And uh, then eventually, uh, Brie Bella gets knocked to the outside. Everybody's, uh, you know, uh, Team Bella's checking on her. Uh, Naomi and Tamina Snuka and uh, Paige and Becky Lynch, um, you know, all come in and have like a little face off with Team Bella. They call them losers and stuff, which is kind of mean. Sasha uh, Banks dives through the ropes and takes out um, Team Bella. And uh, then Charlotte dives over the ropes and takes out. Um, you know, uh, Paige, Becky Lynch, and Brie Bella, uh, on Sasha Banks, and then, uh, eventually the finish comes, uh, Sasha Banks gets, uh, Charlotte into the bank statement, and then Brie Bella throws Sasha Banks' shoulder pushes to the post, she goes for the face buster, Charlotte counters into a powerbomb into the figure eight, Brie taps out, Charlotte wins, which makes sense, I think it made sense to have one of the new call-ups win since they were very new, and uh, obviously it had to be Charlotte or Sasha Banks. I think they went with Charlotte because she was the baby face and they wanted to make her look like a viable threat to possibly take the Divas Championship uh, from Nikki Bella because we knew one of the NXT call-ups NXT call were going to end up doing so. 
Uh, but yeah, uh, the match I thought was a um, a pretty solid match. Um, like I said, my problem with it was there was no purpose for this match. Like I said, they announced this match last minute. I still, um, I also hated the fact that um, Charlotte and Sasha Banks couldn't come out to the lone theme songs. Uh, they had to come out to uh, Team Bad's, which was Naomi's theme, and then Paige's theme. You know, uh, these were very new wrestlers to get, why not get them noticed? Why not just have all of them come out there, just have it be a regular triple threat match with everybody banned from inside, and you just have all those women just go out there, and, well, and there you go, that's all you need. Have Charlotte come out with her theme song, have Sasha Banks come out there, none of these other bullshit distractions. And this is what sucked when they came up. Is they threw the all they had this Divas Revolution, Divas Revolution, Divas Revolution. They kept shoving it down our throats, but there really wasn't a Divas Revolution in the beginning. I mean, they had talked about there was. You kind of it was. You definitely felt like there was definitely some change coming when it came to uh, women's wrestling. Obviously, that started down in NXT, which was started by Paige. Um, and um, you know um. Paige had become the first um, ever NXT Women's Champion. Uh, but that, I would even say maybe even dates back before then. I think it started when AJ Lee won that Divas Championship. And she cut that pipe bomb on all the cast members on Total Divas. AJ Lee was the real one that kind of started the big Divas revolution. Um, you know, you, you notice there was change because uh, AJ Lee actually got mic time to talk. She, her matches would meet, have, some, uh, would get, have some pretty... Decent significance behind him. Um, and then Paige obviously got that one in, you know, uh, when the WWE Network was launched. Uh, one of, you know, uh, Paige and Emma had a, real, had a really damn good match for the uh, NXT Women's Championship. And then uh, after WrestleMania 30, Paige was called up to the main roster. Um, she wrestled AJ Lee and took the title off of AJ Lee for the Divas title. And she was the first... And only women to be both the Divas and NXT Women's Champion, which I don't think is ever going to happen again. I don't think anybody's going to hold, like, one of the women's titles on the main roster and the NXT Women's Championship at the same time. I don't think that's ever going to happen. Um, it's just not going to. And then, um, you know, Paige and AJ Lee got to have a nice feud on the main roster, whether it was actual and it, it was an actual issue. It wasn't just match, 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 and then the match at the pay-per-view itself. It was that actual personal issue. Um, and, you know, it was a good start. And then, obviously, when Nikki Bella took the Divas Championship from Paige, that's when she started to go on her dominant one. No, sorry, from AJ Lee. That's when she started to go on to her dominant one, um, you know, as Divas Champion. Um, then, um, it continued. You know, then you had... Um, but, yeah, after this match... Uh, you had this Divas Revolution happen, and like I said, you started to get longest matches. Um, everybody, uh, I think uh, everybody had been ch trending, tr uh, had been chanting to, to give Divas a chance because they had had like a one-minute match on Raw, and everybody was upset about it. Um, so after this match, what would happen was they would do all these three teams would have a really awful, um, like, uh, triple threat six-woman tag elimination match. I don't know what the fuck you call that. Where it was just a cluster fucking itself. Where uh, Paige's team would win. Uh, actually, the Paige's team would end up... At first, it was called the Submission Sorority. But then the WWE fucked up and realized, wait a minute, that's a, that's a uh, porn site. So let's call them Team PCB. So then, you know, it was known as Team PCB. Um... And they would PC, Team PCB would kind of continue their feud with Team Bella. Charlotte would become the number one contender to uh, Nikki Bella's Divas Championship. And Nikki Bella was on the verge of breaking AJ Lee's record of the longest reigning Divas Champion. But Charlotte wanted to have a match on the Go Home Show of Raw uh, before Night of Champions. And, uh, yeah, Charlotte failed to win the title because of its qualification. So, um, Charlotte ended up uh, just winning the title at Night of Champions any goddamn way because they wanted to write AJ Lee out of the record books since she was married to CM Punk, who was the guy that uh, just walked out of the company and they didn't have good terms with, so they wanted to write AJ Lee out of the record books. And Charlotte and Nikki Bella would have a rematch for the Divas Championship. 
um, at Hell in a Cell, where Charlotte would retain the championship, and then Nikki Bella got hurt, so she got taken off TV to do neck surgery. And then, uh, yeah, Team Bella pretty much disbanded from there, as what happened with Team PCB. The night after Night of Champions, uh, Paige ended up turning here and just going off on the entire Divas division, you know, talking about everything that was wrong with it. And uh, after Paige had a blow-off match with Nikki Bella, she would have a few with uh, Paige. No, after Charlotte had a blow-off match with Nikki Bella, she would have a few with Paige. They wrestled at Survivor Series and TLC for the title, um, where Charlotte retained both times. Uh, going into those matches, it was the awkward thing where uh, Charlotte, uh, where Paige brought up Reed Flair, Charlotte's brother's death, to which... Uh, both all the flares were not okay with, and Paige and Becky Lynch had a mini few where Paige knocked her off in a match. Um, and then, um, what else? Um, Charlotte then in turn heel, which was really weird because uh, she was positioned as the face, it was off, it was awkward, but she ended up turning heel, which ended up really helping her because she was really beginning well, becoming robotic on the main roster. Um, Charlotte and Becky Lynch had a really good match at the Royal Rumble for the title, where uh, Charlotte retained the championship. And then as this was going on, Team Bad um, ended up, uh, you know, uh, continuing their thing. But then Sasha Banks got hurt, so she got taken out, out of Team Bad. She returned at the Royal Rumble and uh, took out Becky Lynch and Charlotte and, then out, and you know, wanted to go after the deepest title. Uh, Sasha Banks got into a mini feud with Naomi and Timmy Nisnucka, former members of Team Bad, to which uh, she would go on to team up with, uh, what's her name? She would go on to team up with Becky Lynch to face uh, Naomi and Tamina Nisnucka at Fastlane, to which they would win. Charlotte would go on to uh, wrestle uh, Brie Bella, because then Charlotte was a heel, Brie Bella turned face um, at Fastlane, where she would retain her Divas Championship. And then uh, at WrestleMania, um, Brie Bella had a final match temporarily with WWE because obviously we know that making a WWE return, well, t training for it anyways, um, to which Naomi and Tamina Snuka were also in that match and also Alicia Fox, I believe. I forget which team she was on, not going to lie. And then um, um, Charlotte... Uh, you know, Charlotte, Becky Lynch, and Sasha Banks would have an amazing triple threat match for the women's title. They rebranded the division, and it was now known as the women's division, no longer the Divas division, and they had a new championship, and Charlotte would go on to win that match and be, like, the first women's champion, and then, um, Becky Lynch had her feud with Emma, but then Emma got hurt, so then she got taken off television. Sasha Banks got taken off TV for some reason. Uh, Naomi and Tamina Saka weren't doing shit, and then, uh, uh, Sasha Banks returned uh, the night after uh, Money in the Bank, I believe, and wanted to go after uh, Charlotte's championship. I even forgot to mention that Sasha even had lost her NXT title by this point. She had lost it before SummerSlam and NXT TakeOver Brooklyn. I forgot to mention that. I'm sorry. Um, and then uh, Sasha Banks and Charlotte had a really good feud for the women's title. Um, after the brand split, uh, Charlotte was drafted to Raw. Sasha Banks was drafted to Raw, um, and um, Becky Lynch um, and Naomi were both drafted to SmackDown, and Alicia Fox was also drafted to Raw, by the way, and um, Tamina Snuka and uh, Nikki Bella were not drafted since they were uh, injured, and uh, um, at SummerSlam, uh, so the night uh, on the Monday Night Raw after the draft, uh, Sasha Banks won the women's championship from Sasha Banks. No, both of them were no from Charlotte. And then uh, at SummerSlam, uh, Charlotte won the championship back on that same show. Uh, Nikki Bella ended up returning from injury um, and doing a six-woman tag that included Becky Lynch um, on the other team. And then uh, she pretty much joined the uh, SmackDown roster since it was a SmackDown exclusive match. You knew that she was going to be on SmackDown. Nikki Bella uh, went on to have a Pretty all right one um, in on SmackDown. Uh, she had some all right feuds, but wasn't wrestling for the title or anything. And then she had a final match. Um, in the meantime, I where uh, you know um, 
it was uh, where uh, her and Cena wrestled a mixed tag, where Cena ended up proposing to her, and now her and Cena are gearing up to get married, where because she's a gold digger, she's just using Cena, um, obviously. Um, and then, um, so that's that. Um, you know, as it comes down to it, uh, continuing though, Charlotte and Becky Lynch uh, had a really good feud in 2016. Charlotte won back the women's title, like I said, at SummerSlam. And then um, Charlotte and Sasha Banks both participated at a triple threat at Clash Champions. And then um, at Hell in a Cell, they could, well, then they went on to on water. Main event uh, while the first woman to do so since 2004-2005 time to what Sasha Banks won back the women's, uh, what was now known as the War Women's Championship. And then they went on to have the first ever women's Hell in a Cell match at Hell in a Cell in 2016, uh, where Charlotte won back her War Women's Championship. And then um, they uh, went on to uh, have the first ever False Count Anywhere match uh, for the War Women's Championship, to which uh, um, Sasha Banks would win back the championship. And then uh, a couple of weeks later, at Roadblock End of the Line, they would have the second ever um, Iron Woman match, but the first one on the main roster. The first one ever was on NXT, to where Sasha Banks was also in for the NXT Women's Championship. But the one on uh, Roadblock End of the Line was between Sasha Banks and Charlotte. Uh, with, uh, she became known as Charlotte Flair, to which Charlotte Flair won the blow-off match and became the new Raw Women's Champion. But as this was going on, you had Becky Lynch, who at Backlash uh, became the first woman to win the SmackDown Women's Championship. And then she held on to that title until uh, December at TLC, when she lost it in the first ever uh, tables match for, the, for a championship, for a Women's Championship. Um, and then... Uh, then she competed in the first ever uh, main event on SmackDown in a cage match uh, for the title. And uh, also in the meantime, you had, uh, you know, Charlotte Flair who wanted to do a her own thing. Uh, Sasha Banks did her own thing. At, um, at Elimination Chamber, after so many years, Naomi had been chasing for a champ to win a woman's title. She finally won the SmackDown Women's Championship at Elimination Chamber, but then she ended up getting injured in that match, so she had to vacate the title. Um, Charlotte Flair and Sasha Banks both competed in the Fatal 4 match at WrestleMania 33 for the championship, and Naomi and Becky Lynch competed in like a women's six-pack challenge for the title, for the SmackDown Women's title at uh, WrestleMania 33, to what's Naomi won that championship in her hometown, and she's been a you know, a pretty terrible champion since then. She really hasn't done much with the title. She's been a bland baby face with the championship. And then afterwards, um, after the Superstar shakeup, Tamina snuck a return and she was uh, drafted over to SmackDown. And then, uh, yeah, that's it uh, for all the women pretty much. But as for Paige, I didn't even mention Paige. Uh, Paige was drafted to Raw after the draft, but we haven't seen Paige. She's been uh, dealing with neck injuries and stuff like that. And obviously, too, you know that she's had that sex tape, leave, sex tape revealed <laughs> where uh, she ended up uh, revealing that she made sex videos with uh, Brad Maddox and Xavier Woods, to which now I can't watch any of their matches the same anymore. And then, um, obviously, um, Paige is in a pretty bad domestic relationship where it's been reported now as of last week, which you can check out my video on it. Uh, right up there, um, where her boyfriend or now her fiance is beating her, uh, but now that now there's reports that she was actually beating him, it, it's a fucked up relationship, um, and it feel really bad for Paige because, uh, yeah, like I talked about, it seems like she's just stuck in that relationship. So, as for Alicia Fox, she pretty much is just nothing right now. She uh, is it was in a pretty lame storyline. Um, all year long and just hasn't really done anything in the Divas division. Well, the women's division. So, uh, yeah. So, long-term wise, the Divas revolution did eventually become a big moment for women's wrestling because they did eventually treat it like it was a women's revolution since you had, you know, all these first-ever matches. You even had the first-ever Money in the Bank uh, women's match not that long ago that Charlotte Flair and uh, Becky Lynch both participated in. And, uh, you know, he had a lot of these first ever for the woman. 
It was the first ever woman's last man, uh, well, last woman standing match at NXT not that long ago. So you've had a lot of first evers recently. Um, and women's uh, main event in Raws and SmackDowns now. You know, they uh, haven't main evented a pay- well, Actually, no. And the other main event in pay-per-views. Uh, you know, you had Charlotte and Sasha Banks main event pay-per-views. Um, and now you're going to have a tournament that's evolved all around women. So you got some women have done some great things from this. You know, I think WWE wanted to finally exploit their women and they've done just that. Uh, but this Divas Revolution, like I said, when it originally started, it was shit. Uh, but then eventually it did get better um, as time went on. So that's my thoughts there. Overall, though, like I said, I thought this was a uh, pretty decent uh, match. Okay, so next, uh, the panel have a segment. And uh, pretty much they just run through uh, what happened on the pay-per-view so far. Nothing fancy, but, you know, it is what it is. Okay, so next was a United States Championship match. United States Champion John Cena versus Kevin Owens. And this was a fantastic match, obviously with a bad finish, which I will obviously rant about, but let me talk about the match first. Um, The match starts off, Kevin Owens gets the upper hand on Cena. He hits a wicked right hand on him, and he dominates the first half of the matchup. He hits a drop kick on Cena. Um... He hits a torture rack backbreaker. He hits a torture rack into a neckbreaker. Uh, covers him. Cena kicks out, and uh, you know Kevin Owens just really dominates Cena with the first half of the matchup. But then Cena uh, comes back with a drop kick. He hits a uh, um, yeah Owens, and then Owens even hit a slam into a senton too. When Cena tried to go for a short for his uh, five moves of doom, and then. Uh, Cena hits a toe to woe slam himself, um, covers him, Owens kicks out, and then uh, Owens and C- um, Cena are about even. So uh, pretty much the match is just a back and forth match. I'll just kind of talk about the big spots in the match. Um, you know, uh, Cena tried to do his five moves with Doom a second time, and he goes for the five knuckle shuffle, but um, Owens rolls out of the win and mocks him by doing the You Can't See Me himself, which I thought was actually. Kind of funny, and then uh, Owens hangs Cena up on the second on the top rope. Goes to go up his um, top turnbuckle and hit a swan tom bomb, but Cena gets his knees up, and then um, Cena hits a, an electric chair face buster move and uh, covers him. Um, Owens kicks out. Cena hits a uh, code of silence, covers him. Um, Owens kicks out. He goes for the springboard stunner. Owens counters it into a German suplex, into a senton, into a cannonball in the corner. Um, Covers Cena. Cena kicks out. Um, And then uh, Owens goes for the pump-up powerbomb. Cena knows that it's coming, so he he, uh, holds on to the ropes. And uh, then um, Owens is able to hit a clothesline on Cena anyways. Cena hits the AA. Owens kicks out. Um, He goes to hit it off the... uh, Second turnbuckle, but um, Owens turned it into a reverse superplex off the top rope, covers him, Cena kicks out, and then um, he goes for the pump-up powerbomb, Cena counters into a hurricanrana, um, and uh, he gets him into the STF the first time, Owens is able to, uh, goes to go to the rope, Cena goes to pull him back, Owens kicks him off, um, Owens hits uh, Cena's five moves to do himself, hits the AA on Cena, and then he gets him into the STF. Cena is able to get to the ropes, which obviously, when you, once you knew that Owens got him into the STF, you knew Cena wasn't tapping. Um, what else? Um, Cena hits another way. Yeah, Owens kicks out. Um, Owens goes. Owens hits a super kick into the pop up power bomb. Uh, Owens Cena kicks out, and then um, Cena hits a squidboard stutter, but he doesn't get all of it. And Owens is able to bounce right back and hit a clothesline, and um, then, um, then they, uh, Cena hits another AA on Owens. Um, Owens kicks out again, and Cena's just in disbelief. Owens goes to go up. Um, Cena hits the uh, leg drop from the top rope. Um, Owens kicks out, and then he goes for it a second time. Owens turns it into a power bomb, which is what broke Cena's neck. 
And throughout the match, um, always just, as Owens gets frustrated, that Cena keeps kicking out. He keeps talking crap to Michael Cole. You know, telling, asking him if he's calling it the right way and if he's watching. And Michael Cole's just like, why don't you, uh, you know, uh, pay attention um, to your opponent. But then Owens goes to go off the top rope. And then Cena catches him. And Cena hits an AA from the uh, second turnbuckle. And uh, covers the Owens. Owens kicks out, which made Owens, I thought, look pretty strong. Because no one's ever kicked out of that move. And then Cena's just in disbelief. And Owens tries to beat him with a roll-up. Cena kicks out. Then Cena gets him into the SDF. And Owens, you think he's going to get to the ropes, but then Cena pulls him back, puts him back in the move, and Owens taps out. And Cena retains the uh, United States Championship. And yeah, so the match I thought was a fantastic match up until the finish. I mean, the match was so fantastic, but it would have been better had Cena not won. Like I talked about before, Owens really needed to win this match, win this U.S. Championship, because... This could have done a lot for Owens if he had taken the one, if he had been the one to take the United States Championship from John Cena, but then that didn't happen. What ended up happening was Kevin Owens lost. Not only did he lose, he tapped out to a submission move that Cena did, that he, Owens performed ten times better on Cena earlier in the match, which was stupid, and. You know, I always hear rumors that, uh, I always hear things that Kevin Owens says that John Cena really helped elevate Kevin Owens. I don't, I personally call bullshit on that because there was no way that you could tell me from this feud that Kevin Owens was elevated by John Cena. He beat him clean once at Elimination Chamber, but then literally two weeks later, two weeks later, John Cena got his win back and beat him at Money in the Bank, and then he, he beats him by tapping him out to a submission move that Owens does better. Because let's take a look at what happens to each guy. Uh, John Cena at SummerSlam ended up losing the United States Championship to Seth Rollins. And then he ended up just regaining it right back at Night of Champions. And uh, then he lost the U.S. title at Hell in a Cell. And that, the, in 2015 was pretty much the last time just Cena would work uh, full-time. Um, as a WWE wrestler, pretty much afterwards, he was pretty much a part-timer. Um, and, yeah, but Cena, I would say his last full-time one uh, was probably the best work he's ever done. You know, he had some really good matches for that U.S. title and really brought prestige into that United States Championship, which was awesome. And then the prestige was ruined. Uh, the U.S. title just went back to what it was. It was back on kickoff shows, which was really stupid. And then, me, um, and then John Cena uh, would return... Um, in 2016, have some great feuds and matches. He would pretty much be a part-timer. Eventually, at the Royal Rumble in 2017 of this year, he would be finally tie uh, Ric Flair's record of becoming a uh, 16-time uh, World Heavyweight Champion. And then he lost the championship at Elimination Chamber to uh, Bray Wyatt. After the draft, too, Cena was drafted to SmackDown. I forgot to mention that. And then he had one final match at WrestleMania. Then he came back. He just returned... Um, this past year, um, well, I mean, obviously, right? he just returned on the July 4th episode of SmackDown, where now he's announced that he's a free agent, so now he can work uh, both on both Monday Night Raw and SmackDown, um, and uh, he's going to be wrestling um, in a flag match this year at Battleground, so obviously this match really didn't hurt or benefit Cena. He pretty much was in the same spot. The guy that needed the benefit from the moment, actually got hurt, because let's take a look at what happened with Kevin Owens. Uh, he pretty much was in an inconsequential, sum well, he pretty much really wasn't doing much at SummerSlam. Um, think about how huge it would have been if Kevin Owens had walked in with that U.S. title, because literally he was in the main event at NXT TakeOver Brooklyn. Imagine how huge it would have been if he had walked in with that U.S. title, but of course, because Cena had to win the feud, it didn't happen. And then um, Kevin Owens... Uh, went on to uh, win the Intercontinental Championship um, at Night of Champions. Um, and he pretty much was stuck in mid-card purgatory forever. He held on to that IC title um, up until uh, TLC 2015. And then he ended up just regaining the championship right back at uh, on an episode of Raw. Held on to that championship and lost it um, at WrestleMania 32 in the opening match. Owens pretty much was in a non wasn't really much of a factor in WrestleMania. He was just thrown into a... Um, I see title ladder match with no purpose where he deserved 
and a proper WrestleMania match. And maybe had Owen beat Cena, he could have gotten just that. Then he went on to, uh, you know, like I said, be stuck in mid-card purgatory. After the, after the grand split, he was drafted to Raw. And, uh, you know, uh, he finally did get, get break into the main event scene. Uh, he won the uh, WWE Universal Championship uh, with the help of Triple H when Triple H ended up turning on Seth Rollins, which turned Seth Rollins' babyface. And Kevin Owens finally got his shine in the main event scene. Had some great matches with Seth Rollins for the WWE Universal Championship. And then, uh, you know, had some pretty decent matches with uh, Roman Reigns for the title. Dropped the title at Fastlane at Goldberg in 22 fucking seconds. And pretty much uh, then um, he was in a uh, U.S. title match and finally did win the U.S. title at WrestleMania. Uh, t- two years too late. He should have won it on this show, but instead he won it at WrestleMania 33. Talk about two years too late. And then he randomly just lost it at Payback, won it right back on SmackDown right afterwards, and then he just lost the title at, at a house show in Madison Square Garden. And pretty much Kevin Owens hasn't been featured all that much. And the way they're booking Kevin Owens right now pretty much just tells me that when he did went, become a main eventer, it was just because he was in the right place at the right time because obviously the first WWE Universal Champion ended up getting hurt. So they just put the title right on Kevin Owens. And yeah, nothing came of it. So pretty much, uh, I really don't see how Kevin o- how John Cena elevated Kevin Owens uh, because of the fact that uh, Kevin Owens pretty much up until 2016 was stuck in mid-card purgatory and was doing nothing. And I just don't really see how, uh, you know, Kevin Owens was elevated by John Cena. Uh, he was not. Um, John Cena, it was just obviously another one of John Cena's victims where he's buried. He's done it to Bray Wyatt. Um, he's done it to uh, Ken Barrett, you know, uh, like I talked about. Um, he's done it to um, a handful of people that I've mentioned. You know, he did it to the whole Nexus faction. And Kevin Owens was just another one of those victims. So, yeah, and it just, you know, it, they always say that John Cena has to get that win back. Would it really have hurt John Cena if he had lost the U.S. title to Kevin Owens? It actually would have elevated Kevin Owens and you can all now there's no reason for them to, for me to ever want to see a Kevin Owens John Cena match ever again because uh he's already beaten and disposed of Kevin Owens Cena's blown through everybody now there's no credible opponents really anymore for Cena to face it's what happens when you cram somebody down your throat for over 10 years Okay, so next, The Miz comes out and cut a promo, and we pretty much why he's cutting this promo was because um, Ryback, The Miz, and Big Show are all supposed to have a triple threat match for the uh, Anacontinental Championship, but Ryback got injured with a staph infection that week, and he couldn't compete, so he sent that big tweet about it, thanking his fans and for his support and stuff. Um, so The Miz comes out and talks about you know how he should be uh, winning the Anacontinental Championship tonight, um, but because Ryback got hurt, that didn't happen, so then all the publicity stuff he was supposed to do as an Intercontinental Champion got, had to get canceled because the match got postponed, and he says that, uh, he talks about how Ryback might have even be injured because he's known Ryback since his days in Tough Enough, <clears throat> and, uh, he talks about how, uh, you know, the, um, he doesn't think that Ryback's really the big guy, he thinks that he's the big pansy, which... Later on, we would find out that The Miz ended up being right about that, which I'll talk about in a second. And uh, The Miz, um, you know, talks about how uh, Ryback was probably just too scared to come out and um, and face The Miz. And uh, then he says that uh, Big Show isn't even here tonight. He hasn't been seen since the Attitude Era. So he wants the authority to do the right thing and cry on him as the white for Winter Continental Champion. Or... Um, but, since the, but then they don't come out. So then he says that he's just going to go and take the Intercontinental Championship. Uh, then the big show comes out. And, uh, you know, Miz is trying to butter him up by talk, saying that uh, he did, um, because this was at a time where people would chant, please retire at big show. And um, the Miz says that, don't listen to what these people just said about you when they said, please retire. I think you have 20 more years left in you. And he's, he, he makes a suggestion that they reform their tag team show Miz and go um, back 
and go and beat up Ryback and take his title, and then Big Show just gets in the way, knocks out Miz, and leaves, and then that was it. I thought this was a pretty lame segment. It really didn't accomplish anything, but obviously they had to throw something out there because I think uh, this was probably where the, the uh, Intercontinental Championship match would have happened, but since Ryback got hurt, they had to do something with him. Why they didn't just do a number one contenders match between Big Show and Miz, when it faces Ryback, would have made more sense, but whatever. Uh, the aftermath came as the Intercontinental Championship triple threat match would happen at SummerSlam when Ryback would retain his championship. And then uh, Ryback and Big Show would continue their feud over the title. Ryback retained his championship, um, you know, um, on uh, an episode of Wall against Big Show. Then, uh, you know, uh, because because uh, the Miz screwed him over, the Miz and Big Show looked like they were going to get into a feud, but it didn't happen. And then... Um, um, Ryback would go on to uh, lose the Intercontinental Championship to Kevin Owens at Night of Champions. Then he lost his rematch at Hell in a Cell. Um, and then, um, you know, um, Ryback pretty much just kind of floundered for a while. He ended up uh, turning heel and uh, going after the U.S. title. Pretty much became known as the pre-show stopper. And then uh, he had his final match at the kickoff show at Payback where he lost a United States title match. And ended up walking out the next night. Uh, for the reasons we already know, because he felt like that uh, he wasn't being utilized to his potential, that people should have been getting better payouts and stuff. And then we found out later that Ryback was a big pansy, because now he always complains about uh, everything that the WWE does. So the, like I said again, like I always say, Miz speaks truth. As for Miz and Big Show, uh, Big Show just kind of worked out as a part-time basis. Eventually, he ended up getting like in tremendous shape. You know, uh, he was drafted to to uh, Monday Night Raw after the brand split, and he just, now he's getting in tremendous shape, which is awesome, you know, I think he proved to all the people that told him to please retire back in 2015, and myself, because I was one of those people, um, one that showed he could have a few more years left in him, and as for The Miz, he would, uh, you know, uh, pretty much have a stagnant part on the roster for a while, he would win the uh, Intercontinental Championship the night after WrestleMania 32. Uh, he would have some pretty solid title defenses for the Intercontinental Championship. And then after, um, you know, um, after the brand split, he was drafted to SmackDown. He cut that great promo about Daniel Bryan and stuff um, on Talking Smack and did some uh, great stuff as Intercontinental Championship. Lost it at uh, Mel Mercy. We gained it back on the SmackDown before Survivor Series. Uh, lost the title again. Um, Earlier this year, we gained it back at Extreme Wolves, uh, and he was drafted to Raw after the Superstar Shakeup. And the Miz has done some great work, um, and probably is one of the best mic workers in WWE today. He always has been a great mic worker, and that just proves it. So uh, overall, the one that benefited long term from this was actually the Miz, the guy that got knocked out. Uh, Big Show. This didn't benefit or hurt him since he had been a legend. Why back? Uh, had already been hurt and would continue to suffer more damage. And Ryback was one of John Cena's victims that he buried too, so twice. So, yeah. Overall, though, this segment really wasn't anything special. Okay, so then we had the main event. It was a WWE World Heavyweight Championship match. WWE World Heavyweight Champion Seth Rollins versus Brock Lesnar with Paul Heyman ringside. And... I can understand why a lot of people don't like this match because this was a match that was being hyped up for over a year, or a little bit over, you know, a little bit over a year, for months, and you know, this was the match they came up with. I understand it, and I can get you. Um, I can understand why people are disappointed. I could, I could see where you're disappointed because, um, you know, it really wasn't really a match. Wallens really didn't get any offense in. However. I enjoyed this match because it was they made it this match seem believable. And I let me, let me explain. So obviously the match starts. Um, Lesnar immediately drives Wallens in the corner. He starts hitting uh, shoulder thrust smashes in the corner, whatever they're called. And uh, Wallens then takes a breather. Uh, Lesnar chases after him. Um, and Wallens just runs away. He rolls back in the wind. Lesnar rolls back in. Wallens tries to hit, fire away with a few right hands. Um... But Brock Lesnar uh, hits a knee to the gut. He takes him down with some amateur wrestling stuff. And uh, he goes for an F5. Rollins rolls out of the win. 
And then the, um, he rolls back in. Lesnar starts to fire away on Seth Rollins. He hits five German suplexes in a row. And Rollins rolls out of the win. He's just about to just get himself counted out and leave. He grabs his title, walks through the crowd. Lesnar jumps over the barricade, uh, grabs Rollins, throws him over the barricade. Um, and uh, then he uh, uh, continues to, uh, to pick apart Seth Rollins. Um, he hits um, a sixth German suplex on him. Then he goes for a seventh German suplex. But Rollins lands on his feet. He takes, he uh, kicks him in the knee. Um, and he he hits a uh, um, three super kicks, but Lesnar still stays on his knees. And then he hits a super kick uh, right to the face. He goes for the pedigree. Lesnar counters. Rollins continues to attack Lesnar. He drives him out of the win. And then he hits uh, two suicide dives on the outside. He goes for a third one. Lesnar counters into um, a belly to back suplex. And then he hits a uh, um, he hits a uh, Six more German suplex on him, and then a total we had 13 German suplexes on Seth Rollins. And then he hits an F5. Now, before I talk about the finish, the reason why I like this match so much is because it, it made it believable. You had Seth Rollins, who was that weasel heel who was too afraid to face Brock Lesnar. You had Brock Lesnar, who was that monster, dominated him. And if you think about it, if these two really got into a fight, Lesnar would destroy Seth Rollins. So that's why I like it. They made this match actually realistic. But yeah, Lesnar hits the F5. He's, he goes to cover Seth Rollins to win the championship. But then the lights goes up. The lights go out. The Undertaker's gone goes off. And who's and then when the lights come back on, the Undertaker's standing right in the wind. And Brock Lesnar looks at, at him like he's just seen a ghost. Now the reason why the Undertaker showed up was because Brock Lesnar conquered the Undertaker's undefeated streak at uh, 21 and one at WrestleMania 30. So Undertaker was looking to get some revenge here. So uh, Undertaker goes to choke slam Brock Lesnar. Lesnar uh, jumps out of it, goes for an F5. Taker gets out of it, um, hits a low blow on Lesnar, hits a choke slam, then a tombstone. And you think Taker's just going to walk off, but then he sees that Brock Lesnar's getting back to his feet. So then he hits a second tombstone on Brock, which I thought was badass. Then afterwards, he does the, um, the lights go out, his theme song goes off, he does his taunt, he walks out, he lifts his hand out, hit, hand up, and leaves. And. Yeah, I thought uh, I thought that shit was awesome. Um, it just made uh, having Undertaker show up here. It had been speculated throughout the day, anyways, but it was still a nice surprise. It wasn't, you know, everyone thought it was just a rumor that Undertaker was showing up. And when the Undertaker did show up, it was awesome. Um, Taker um, very rarely shows up. The only time you normally saw Taker was during WrestleMania time, and the fact that he showed up at a pay per view like. Um, Battleground was awesome. Uh, I think it made sense to incorporate The Undertaker because at the time, you really couldn't have either, um, neither Brock Lesnar or Seth Rollins lose. You couldn't really have Brock Lesnar win that WWE World Heavyweight Championship because you then you run into the risk of having the WWE Championship, uh, WWE World Heavyweight Championship not be on television as much. And, you know, um, it really kind of would have hurt Seth Rollins' uh, momentum. You couldn't have Seth Rollins defeat Brock Lesnar because... Uh, Brock Lesnar uh, was a, um, you know, an ass-kicking machine, so I think it made sense to have, um, you know, uh, have have no one really win and have an Undertaker come in. I think fit because it set up um, to the SummerSlam main event and everything. And obviously, then we have the aftermath. We would find out because we didn't find out the result that Brock Lesnar would win this match the next night on Raw by disqualification, meaning that Seth Rollins kept his uh, WWE World Heavyweight Championship. Brock Lesnar and Undertaker, you know, would go on um, to um, have a great program going into SummerSlam. Taker said the reason that he did this was because Brock Lesnar conquered a streak and Taker uh, and Brock and Le Paul Heyman kept constantly bragging about it. So this led to the match at SummerSlam, but Undertaker would defeat Brock Lesnar uh, and it ended up being a fantastic match. And Taker ended up uh, cheating to win um, when, he hit the, when he hit the low blow on, uh, you know, Brock. And uh, the, the timekeeper stuff all happened. So then this led to the blow-off match in Hell in a Cell. In a Hell in a Cell match. In a fantastic match. Where Brock Lesnar would finally de defeat The Undertaker. And, uh, you know, uh, that would be the blow-off match. Then Taker would have uh, would get attacked by the Wyatt family. And then I already mentioned what happened with, at the 25 years anniversary of Taker. Where the Brothers of Destruction defeated Bray Wyatt and Luke Hopper. 
And then Undertaker would go on to have uh, two more WrestleMania appearances. Then he had his final WrestleMania match against Roman Reigns, where Roman Reigns defeated him and retired The Undertaker. And it still makes me sad to kind of see Undertaker show up uh, watching some past stuff with, Ta- with Undertaker wanted, thinking that Undertaker uh, won't, um, is now retired because it's still kind of weird because he's been wrestling for so long. Thinking about it, too, it's going to be weird watching WrestleMania 34 next year, knowing that The Undertaker won't be wrestling on it because um, it's just going to be a weird feeling. And then, um, you know, as for Seth Rollins, he would go on to the, defeat John Cena um, and win the United States Championship, becoming the first and only person in WWE history to win both the WWE Championship and the United States Championship. And then Seth Rollins would go on to lose the championship back to Cena at uh, Night of Champions. Seth Rollins continued to have a great year. Uh, he had a pretty decent feud with uh, Kane. Well, uh, it was corporate Kane and Demon Kane. You know, they had been building that for a while. Seth Rollins def- um, defeated Kane and retained his championship. Um, and, um, you know, um, you know, Seth, uh, yeah, he defeated Kane to retain his championship. And they had corporate Kane get fired as director of operations. Then Seth Rollins would go on. He would, uh, uh, he was supposed to face Roman Reigns at Survivor Series for the championship. But then he ended up getting injured. So um, he ended up... Uh, he, had a, he got a torn ACL, a MCL in his knee. So then Seth Rollins uh, was injured. He came back at Extreme Rules and took out who was the, um, the uh, WWE World Heavyweight Champion at the time, Roman Reigns, which would lead to the rematch at Money in the Bank, where Seth Rollins defeated Roman Reigns for the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. Then he ended up losing the title later on in the night. And then uh, after the brand split, uh, Seth Rollins was drafted to Raw. He was ironically drafted by Stephanie McMahon, who was obviously always back in Seth Rollins. Uh, Seth Rollins would go on to, um, you know, um, lose the re- his rematch uh, at Battleground the next year for, um, in 2016 for the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. And then, um, uh, what else? Seth Rollins then would um, uh Failed to become the first ever WWE Universal Champion at SummerSlam. And then uh, then we had that whole Triple H thing where Kevin Owens won the championship. And then Seth Rollins ended up turning face. Had a great feud with Kevin Owens for the WWE Universal Championship. And then he started his feud with Triple H. Triple H cost him a chance to compete in the Royal Rumble match. So then Seth Rollins invaded NXT TakeOver San Antonio. Um, and wanted to fight Triple H. So then we finally had the match. It looked like Seth Rollins wasn't going to be able to compete at uh, WrestleMania 33 because he ended up getting injured again, the same knee. But then eventually he did um, come back. And then eventually Seth Rollins went on to defeat Triple H at WrestleMania. And since then, he really hasn't done too much. He's been a pretty bland baby face. He had a pretty awful feud. Well, a pretty weak feud, I should say, with uh, Bray Wyatt. And then um, to what she lost to him at uh, Great Balls of Fire. And now it looks like they're going to start um, a Shield reunion. So... Because now Seth Rollins is currently in a feud with The Miz. So it is what it is. Um, overall, though, both superstars have benefited greatly from this. Seth Rollins was the superstar of the year pretty much in 2015. And Brock Lesnar obviously was uh, continued to be great. And, you know, had a great feud with Taker. Had a, probably the best feud of the year. So overall, both superstars benefited tremendously from this match. I wish we could have a rematch. Maybe, hopefully, we do get that rematch. Brock Lesnar, Seth Rollins... You have the moment is right. Rollins is now a face. Brock Lesnar is the heel with the WWE Universal Championship. I do hope we get a rematch and have a legitimate match with Brock Lesnar and Seth Rollins. But only time will tell if that's going to happen. But overall, I still thought this was a, uh, you know, a really good ma- um, a really good match here. Okay, so now I'm going to give you guys my star ratings and overall thoughts from the show. So starting with. Uh, the pre-show match, I'm probably going to give that match two stars. It was really just an average match, nothing special. For the uh, match between uh, Randy Orton and Sheamus, I'm probably going to give that match uh, uh, two and three-quarter stars. I thought that was, uh, no, actually, probably two and a half stars, actually, because I thought that was a, uh, you know, a pretty decent match. Um, I thought both perform- um, I thought that was the best two, uh, that was the best match those two have ever had with each other. Uh, for the uh, WWE Tag Team Championship match, I'm probably going to give that match, um, Three stars. I thought that was a good, solid tag team match. For the uh, Bray Wyatt-Roman Reigns match, probably going to give that match, um, you know, uh, 
three and a half stars. I thought that was a, a really good uh, match there. White person went over. For the uh, Divas match, I'll probably give that match uh, three, uh, two and three quarter stars. I thought that was a pretty decent match there. Like I said, it just... Obviously, the whole stuff where they were promoting the Divas Revolution obviously hurts that match, but I thought overall they all had a pretty decent match with each other. The white person, I thought, went over. So, yeah. Uh, for the uh, United States Championship match, I thought that was a fantastic match. Just obviously hurt by the finish and who won. So, I'll probably give that match uh, four stars. And then um, for the uh, WWE World Heavyweight Championship match, I'm probably going to give that match um, uh Three and a quarter star. I thought that was a uh, really well done match. Um, not just just because of uh, the fact that they kept that match realistic. I liked the appearance of the Undertaker, so I liked that. And that's uh, my star ratings. I'll leave those down in the description box below. And as for my overall thoughts on the show, um, I thought this was a really good show here. I still um, enjoy watching it, watching it back. I might have enjoyed it a little bit more. You know, I thought uh, each match got better and better. Um, as the show went along, um, I, you know, um, I liked, uh, and, uh, you know, I liked some of the booking decisions they made by having, uh, you know, um, the primetime players win, even though it didn't really go anywhere, but still having Charlotte win her first pay-per-view match, having, uh, Taker show up, ha um, having, um, Bray Wyatt beat Roman Reigns, um, and having Ken Barry retain his crown. Um, and yeah, I just had some good matches. What hurts this show, I think, is um, some of the booking decisions and where some of the guys are nowadays in the code. You know, having Cena beat Owens is awful. Having um, something else on here that hurts the show. That segment with The Miz and The Big Show, what was that? You know, the whole to uh, Divas Revolution stuff, backstage segments they were doing. Um, having Randy Orton defeat Sheamus, your Money in the Bank contract holder. Uh, so that's some stuff like that I didn't care for. and uh, But there really wasn't a bad match on the show. I think uh, if um, in win wise it's good, just some booking decisions I think hurt it. But if I had to rate this show, I'll probably rate it an 8.5 out of 10. I thought it was a really good show here. Um, not much issues with it. Uh, you had some really good matches on this show, and I enjoyed it. So uh, that's pretty much it, guys. Uh, thank you guys for watching this video. Please make sure to subscribe um, to this YouTube channel and like this video. Make sure you click on that bell so that way every time I upload a YouTube video, you'll get the notification for it. Uh, then make sure you subscribe to my CM Brothers and Orlando Talking Into YouTube channels. Um, and click on the bell on those videos as well so that way you'll know every time I upload a video on those channels. And that's pretty much it, guys. Talk to you later.